Hi again, everyone, and welcome to the 2023 annual LIDAR EFI cross-country checkup. My name is Sharon Yang from the Canadian Institute of Forestry, and we are very pleased to collaborate with Philip Edward Shea at the Canadian Wood Fiber Centre to host this webinar. The CIF will be providing the platform and the technical support for this webinar. With that, I will now pass it over to Philip Edward Shea, Forest Research Officer from the Canadian Wood Fiber Centre, who will moderate and kick off this webinar. Thank you, Sharon. Here, let me share my screen here. Oh, share. And voila. OK, everything works. Well, thank you so much for uh, for joining us for this uh, Enhanced Force Inventory cross Crunchy Checkup of 2023. Um, yeah, as Sharon said, I'm, my name is Philip Edward Che, and I'm really excited to, to be your host today. Um, I come from the Canadian Wood Fiber Centre, and I'm based here in uh, Fredericton by the beautiful Willistook River on the unceded territories of the Willistook, and um, which are governed by the Peace and Friendship Treaties. Uh, I'm fairly new to EFIs, uh, so I don't really consider myself a, an expert. I have been learning over the last few years uh, more and more, and the development has been fantastic. So today I'm going to start it off with, uh, an, 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 with a little introduction to what is an EFI so that we're all on the same page uh, before the deep dive and, and the checkups from the different uh, jurisdictions across the country and some of our research staff. Um, so what is an in enhanced forest inventory? So first of all, there's no Wikipedia page for EFI. So if anyone's up for the challenge, it's, uh, it's up for grabs. Uh, although you could always append the one on, on forest inventories because it's all very closely linked. Uh, even within the CFS, we have a few definitions, but um, we have one here um, in a report that says, typically an EFI refers to a forest inventory that incorporates uh, airborne laser scanning based in estimates of important forest inventory attributes. And that's typically what we think about when, when the traditional definitions of an EFI as we've grown accustomed to. Um, but today we're gonna push the boundaries a little bit and use uh, the definition that's on our NRCAM website that says uh, an EFI is anything that enhances the quality, accuracy, and precision of a forest inventory data uh, to produce information to a level of precision required for the forest value chain optimization. Um, so a little bit more inclusive. And in Canada, we have a little bit of a special scenario where uh, compared to other smaller countries where we have two major types of forest inventories. Um, so we have the national forest inventory. That's a sample based assessment at a coarser, coarser national scale uh, that's used for national and international reporting and policy making. Um, and then we have forest resource inventories that are at the provincial and, and territorial scale, uh, where the emphasis is on getting the best current conditions uh, for forecasting timber supply and decision making uh, with industry and, and, and government. Uh, so, the forest research in, uh, resource inventories, uh, where we want the best information available uh, and latest, and the NFI, where we where it's emphasizing statistical rigor and rapid. Uh, repetition of measurements over the long term. Um, but either way, forest inventories are the most important source of information for the forest management and for forest value chain. Uh, and EFIs are a tool um, that are, you know, area-based approaches to enhance the, 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 the amount of detail and information we get out of our, our forest inventories. And so today we're gonna to focus on, on kind of the provincial and territorial scale, uh, but some of these techniques can be applied also to, to our national forest inventory um, to some extent. So what needs enhancing in a forest inventory? So obviously we want always more detail, more spatial detail. Um, you can imagine that uh, this is essential for the forest value chain and operational planning, you know, where to build roads. Uh, I know that when I get more detail in between topographic lines, it tells me whether it's a cliff or a steep slope, it's very useful. Um, and all, we always want more attributes as well in our inventories, uh, so more information. We're moving away from, well, we're moving from a, a inventories that focused on volumes of commercial species and uh, delineated stand, stand boundaries. And we've moved on to getting specific uh, top heights for individual trees, 
Uh, and then we can move on towards species and fiber characterization attributes or even holistic ecosystem um, uh, indices um, that would add more value to these, these inventories. Obviously, the question of precision and accuracy always comes up, and so we always want more, the, the more precise and the more accurate. Uh, but as uh, uh, Lane said famously a few years back, uh, you know, what is precise enough? That's also a question because all these improvements in your uh, inventories also come at a cost, and the cost is often the frequency of update. Uh, so the more uh, in, the more complicated it is to to do an inventory, the more time it takes to do it, uh, and often the more cost and uh, the more information, sometimes also the more complicated it is to, to use the information. So user friendliness is something also that can some, that has to be taken under consideration when developing an EFI, um, as well as uh, maintenance and workflow compatibility, uh, especially if you want to uh, imp uh, have a comparable product to what was already done um, and how to maintain the new product is, is something that you have to con consider because all of these more information is always coming at the cost of you know more data and then you have to do more data management and storage uh, as well as find the right human resources and the expertise to manage these these uh, pipelines and workflows uh, and data sets uh, so it's always a balancing act there are some costs associated with with uh, improving your your inventories uh, and you have to find the, the solution that best suits your needs so how to enhance your forest inventories? I'm going to go over a little basic EFI toolkit here. Uh, so considering that we're trying to tie ground truths to remote sense data to generate spatially explicit attributes at larger scales, um, the first thing that we want is some ground truths. So traditionally, that's done with you know a set of ground plots. Uh, and the, the shape and form and layout of ground plots is, is a whole <laughs> Uh, well, there's a whole a whole different type, uh, a bunch of different types, and 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 different rules and reasons why you would want to set up different different styles. Um, but we've also improved the types of measurements that we do on the ground from traditional tree measurements of dbh and heights to um, to some much more uh, improved uh, measurements. Uh, and we have a lot of tools that help. Um, improve our, our measurements, such as high accuracy GPSs that are coming at a lower cost. We have hypsometers that allow us to stem map individual trees uh, uh, rapidly and more accurately. Uh, a lot of jurisdictions are now using um, digital field tablets that hopefully reduce the amount of errors uh, that we uh, in, in when we're gathering data, uh, we have a sampling of soil of soil cores at field at ground plots. We have wildlife monitoring, and uh, we have some new tools such as uh, terrestrial lidar, whether it's fixed or mobile, which are becoming more which are uh, becoming more and more usable for uh, EFI-like uh, pro uh, processes, um, as well as industry data, uh, such as uh, scaling data or harvester head data that's being used to, to develop and improve um, the metrics in our, in our forest inventories. Uh, unmanned uh, aerial vehicles are another tool that's being used. Um, so UAVs now have a bunch of, of sensors that are now compatible with a less than 25 kilogram um, UAV, which is kind of a threshold of, of weight limit in Canada. Uh, so we have visible bands, near infrared, multispectral, hyperspectral, thermal, laser scanning, and radar sensors um, that are at our, you know, ready to be used. <laughs> and, and so the, the data that we gather using UAVs is generally considered a ground truth um, since it's smaller in scope, but uh, you, know, you can, uh, easily assess some decently sized areas uh, that would allow you to, um, you know, delineate natural disaster areas such as after a fire or map uh, forest health, um, you know, uh, to, to using, you know, optical sensors or other tools, um, you know, such as, you know, detecting insect and disease, uh, you know, ranges. Uh, these are really useful tools because they fly, fly below cover at uh, cloud cover, which is very useful for some areas and are relatively low cost, but there's still some work needed in, in, in uh, developing pipelines and validations of products that are out there. Uh, our airborne laser scanning is our classic EFI tool uh, that, that's been used since day one. Um, I'll note here that we have our uh, new federal airborne LIDAR data acquisition guidelines that have just been published in 
uh, this past year, uh, if, you, if you're not already aware. And so this is our large scale high resolution data that allows us to really scale up some of the ground truth. Um, and operationally, it's been used for forest area structure, inventory attributes, biomass, and, and I believe now we have also habitat connectivity, riparian zones, post disturbances, um, uh, structure, canopy gaps, and growth and yield, carbon storage, and hydrological modeling. And I'm, I'm curious to see if anyone's going to be uh, updating us on, on their species determination using the airborne laser scanning today. Um, and finally, we have, our, well, we also have our satellite environmental data, uh, which are basically our wall to wall products that allow us to scale the ground truth to really, you know, uh, the large, large scale mapping. And uh, these are always, there's always new uh, products coming to market, uh, whether it's free or for a fee. Usually the difference uh, comes at, a, at the resolution, uh, but you can get some pretty good 30 meter uh, resolution for free uh, out there. And, um, and so we have new soil maps and climate maps continuously being generated and new satellites are being shot into orbit and coming operational for uh, photogrammetry and other types of, of information, uh, such as high res optical, radar, hyperspectral, soil moisture. And we even have some plant fluorescent since uh, satellites coming up soon, which will be exciting. Part that someti sometimes is overlooked in developing an EFI is the importance of your models and artificial intelligence and in developing them. Um, so AI has come a long way and whether you're using a more traditional, you know, average decision trees uh, such as uh, random forests or are moving on to more advanced AI such as uh, uh, convolutional neural networks. Um, you'll have to be <laughs> thinking about how you're going to be wanting to process the data that you're, you're gathering. Uh, and developing these, these training data sets can be quite costly. Um, and so there's room here for collaboration and, and data sharing, in my opinion. And I think, uh, you know, licensing probably comes into play. Um, and I haven't found any... Um, pre-trained models or data sets uh, on, on open source platforms such as Hugging Face, but it's something that I would encourage people to consider when they are developing their, their inventories so that we can share these tools um, with people that maybe don't have the, uh, the, um, the, the ability to, to, to train their own internal data sets. You know, a bit like we do for growth and yield models or taper and volume equations where uh, if, if a species is less common in your, in your jurisdiction, then you can um, use the equations developed by another another jurisdiction. And finally, yeah, we have our data processing pipelines and product validation pipelines. And now I have a very complex figure up here. And it's kind of intentional um, that, uh, you know, the development and improvements that we see in, in these pipelines is occurring at every single step along the way. And so it can be quite intimidating for, for a, a beginner or a person who wants to adopt a new, a new protocol um, to try to decide and, and make sense out of these. Um, and then the processes may also differ whether you're generating a new product or updating an old product, or if your focus is temporal comparisons versus, you know, getting the latest and greatest current status for planning and operations. Um, and whether you're doing it in-house or con contracting it out, it's important um, that you have an understanding of these pipelines and the details that you need along the way, you know, such as what technology to use, what data processing you want, and how to quality control the data, and how to schedule the data acquisition. Uh, and all this is important for the timely delivery of useful data. Um, and so this is my moment to emphasize the, the value of collaborating and, and making your guidelines public and, and share those with, with, with other people. Um, so here I have, uh, you know, the, the figure that I have in the back was from Joanne's report in 2017, you know, model development of application of uh, guidelines for generating EFI using uh, ALS. Um, and then I mentioned the federal airborne LIDAR data acquisition guidelines. We also have a LIDAR our book, um, which was uh, made possible by the AWARE funding and the Ministère du Québec and, and Université Laval. So this is a really fun open source um, guide that has some great examples in it. And I have here also um, a, a report from the government of Alberta of methods determining the accuracy and comparing the agreement between ground measures and advanced force inventory techniques. So if you have guidelines and tools um, and pipelines uh, described in, in, in nice, clear detail, uh, I'm sure people would appreciate you sharing them out there. And, and they're available. There's some out there. Um, so now that brings me to how many EFI products 
uh, do you need? And traditionally, we had one force resource inventory that you know took a lot of time to build, and was used for strategic resource planning, whether it's determining you know annual allowable cut or forest management plans. And then this information was hierarchically passed down for tactical planning and operational planning. And finally, you know, operations had to deal with whatever instructions were passed down, and sometimes supplementing it with pre-harvest inventories that gave a bit more detail on what's happening on the ground. Um, and then the operations maybe would feed back into the inventories. Uh, but we're having more detail and we're having spatially uh, accurate, uh, spatially explicit uh, accurate uh, information that's coming in in the EFI. So what I'm seeing happening is kind of a switch towards a more um, uh, dynamic uh, uh, set of, of enhanced forest inventory layers uh, that are continuously being fed and improved by feedback from from the different levels of the forest value chain, and and hopefully this will allow for a more uh, dynamic uh, product that allows for near term flexibility and communications between the different levels of planning. And obviously, uh, we're a big country with uh, different jurisdictional challenges. Uh, we have a, a wide you know, ge different, different geography and weather and, and forest types across the country. And everyone has to deal with a unique set of uh, historical legacies and uh, current social political conditions uh, and industry and stakeholder um, uh, environments, uh, as well as a structure of organizations or, or restructuring that, that is occurring. Um, so we do need custom solutions at different areas around the country, but uh, sharing information and technological developments uh, is a benefit to all of us. And so that's why we're here. And thanks for joining us. And, and a special thanks to our speakers who agreed to share their insights uh, into what they've been doing. Um, I really appreciate it. And I'm sure other people will too. Um, so without further ado, um, I'm going to uh, lead the talk. Uh, you know, set the stage for uh, Matt Angus, who's going to be talking about uh, Prince Edward Island's update. So Matt, if you uh, want to share your screen, you're welcome to do so. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I will do that. Great. Okay. I think that's it. Uh, boom. Okay. Thank you, Pez. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, as you said, my name is Matt Angus. I'm reporting here from Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island, uh, as part of the resource inventory and modeling section of our Forest, Fish, and Wildlife Division. I'm going to talk briefly this morning on our recent acquisition of a full wall-to-wall -wall provincial EFI and how we started applying that to some forest operations in the province. Uh, well, so Pez did a great uh, intro there on what an EFI is and the components that go into it. Uh, here's the five major milestones of, of our EFI. Uh, so first, we, we flew the LIDAR and aerial photography together at the same time in the summer of 2020. Uh, that was all processed, rectified by the vendor before being delivered. At the same time, we were collecting all of our ground plots uh, for our traditional forest inventory. Uh, data that were then used to process the EFI. So we got all our photos, we've got the LiDAR point clouds and all of our ground data that was sent to an EFI vendor, a contract was awarded and final product delivered last March. Uh, break down our imagery and LiDAR stats here quickly. Uh, area of interest was the full province of PEI, 5,700 square kilometers. We upped our photo resolution to 30 centimeters this time around, uh, down from 40 centimeters in 2010. Uh, LiDAR density, we also increased since our last rendition uh, in 2008. We upped that to six points per square meter and up to eight vertical returns. Uh, some more detailed stats can be seen there. I won't dive into all of those. Uh, and here we are. So here is a small sample of our LiDAR product. I think we've shown this before, but uh, it's colorized here by elevation above sea level. And we can see how detailed it is. So we've got a riparian area, uh, some mixed forest, and an even uh, regenerating stand there. Uh, one thing I want to note is that even with our eight vertical returns uh, in our densest canopies, we are missing some ground points. We can see here some, some larger gaps. Uh, while that's not a huge issue for our EFI, it does cause some issues on our, our surface models uh, that we can see here. 
this is another profile. Uh, this issue has to do with classification. So the orange dots here were classified as ground. Uh, the gray ones were not. And we can see there's a number that should have been or could have been. Uh, this issue was pointed out to us by NRCAN's high resolution DEM project team. And the issue that it causes, we can see on the left there, a triangulation of that surface model. Uh, so that, again, not a whole lot to do with our EFI, but it was a, a hiccup on our LIDAR journey that we've gotten reclassified, got that fixed up. But again, you can see lots of triangulation there. When we look at floods and water penetration, that doesn't work as well. Uh, okay, so moving quickly here to our ground plot campaign. Uh, here's our point distribution across the province, along with our 19 NFI photo plots and two ground plots. Uh, so we've got great coverage from tip to tip here. Uh, some larger gaps in our heavier agriculture areas where it doesn't fall in the forest. But yeah, we've gotten great coverage there. And here is our plot layout. Uh, again, we've all seen something similar. As Pez said, there's as many variations on this as you like. Uh, we use a fixed radius plot with a bunch of subplots uh, measuring all kinds of different stuff. And some highlights here from our two seasons of work. Uh, first off is that we hired seven new young professionals in the industry, uh, all of whom are still employed in, in some fashion here in the Maritimes doing similar stuff. Uh, so we, we hang our hat on that, feeling pretty good about it. Uh, they captured 822 plots. We recorded the species, diameter, crown class, and estimated products from 31,000 trees. Uh, we took the height and increment board, uh, another 1,600 of those, uh, measured the height, diameter, species, of uh, 22,000 saplings, measured 4,900 pieces of coarse woody debris, and our veg plots turned up 311 unique plants. That's all different trees, shrubs, ferns, mosses, wildflowers, everything. Uh, that's the ground stuff. Uh, so back to the checklist here. We have our photography done, LIDAR, point clouds completed. Uh, I've been all delivered, ground data is collected and ready to award the EFI contract. Uh, so that went out for a bid and was awarded to Leading Edge Geomatics out of Fredericton. Uh, completed EFI was delivered as a point feature class with 14 million points, each representing a 400 square meter cell which is the same size as our ground plot. Um, and here's another small sample of that. Again, this looks fairly bright on there. Uh, each cell is represented here by the dots and I've got them colorized by gross total volume. So we can see in the farmer's fields there, it's all black, no volume, going through orange up to white being the highest volume. So we'll just keep that in your head for now. These are all the attributes that we have in our EFI. So there are over a dozen, and then the percent basal area classes all the way from 20 up to 40 centimeter basal area. So loads and loads. Uh, we picked all of these after a short jurisdictional scan, see what others did, as well as working with the vendor to see what they could provide. Uh, so overall, th these are more metrics than we've really been able to dive into yet. Uh, but we do have them and we'll store them and use them as best we can as new things come up. Uh, again, it's kind of a better to have it situation. Uh, one thing that we have started looking at more that uh, has more impact is the gross total volume. Uh, we saw that before and here's how we're trying to apply that. This is a small section of public forest here in PEI. This is uh, our Brookvale Provincial Nordic Ski Park, uh, which is gonna be a main venue for the Canada Games upcoming here in a couple of weeks. Uh, this is a photo from 2010 uh, as part of our previous forest inventory. Uh, we can see it is pretty well fully forested, lots of spruce plantations, some mixed wood stands and beautiful trails meandering everywhere. Uh, looks great. And then in September of 2019, we were hit with the strongest storm that we've ever experienced in Dorian. And this is our 2020 imagery at the same spot. Uh, so these were not supposed to be harvested, but they all blew down and were salvaged and cleaned up beautifully, uh, retained all kinds of stuff along the edges of the trails just to maintain that feel while you're out there. 
so yeah, it was all salvaged and tidy up. And then in September of this year, we were hit with the next largest storm we've ever had in Fiona. And we've got another image now. Uh, again, the color is kind of tough here. It's a little later in the spring, or sorry, later in the fall, and it's drone imagery, so it's really high resolution. But again, we can see we lost a lot of blow, a lot of stands on the edges. Um, scan through those one more time here 2010, 2020, and 2022. So that's just getting picked away bit by bit. Um, I'll zoom in on one patch here, and you can see it's all on its side. Uh, so people see this and they ask us uh, how much wood was lost in the storm. Uh, well, first they ask how much forest was lost in the storm. And we try to remind them that, you know, we didn't lose the forest. It's it's changed a lot. It's it age is a lot younger and the species comp is different, but but it's still forest. It's not lost forest, but but looking at how much wood volume might be might be on its side is something that we we've been trying to look at. Uh, and the EFI is helping us do that. And this is how. So uh, this is the same drone shot. Uh, here we have our photo interpreted stand boundaries on there. And I will highlight these five up here as being obviously damaged. Uh, so one was the one we saw before where it was completely on its side. And some statistics on those uh, right off. We've got four of them, our old field white spruce, very common type here in PEI. And the other one is a 55 year old pine plantation. Uh, so we estimated the amount of the stand that's blown down. And then we took the dots you saw before and summarized them for each stand. Uh, so we took the average value for gross total volume of all the points within those stands uh, and that's seen in gross total volume per hectare. Add in the stand area, and we have a estimated volume lost in each one of those stands. Uh, so we'll get a chance to see how good these estimates are uh, once it, they do get salvaged, and we see what uh, how much wood comes out of there. Uh, we'll compare those and see how how well they match up. Uh, but we but we like the notion. Uh, it seem it seems like a a good method. And we're pretty happy with the preliminary math that we've done so far. Uh, so we have a plan in place to apply it uh, to the whole province. Now, uh, so some steps towards that are uh, we are acquiring submeter resolution satellite imagery of the whole province uh, post Fiona, as close to after the storm as we can get. And then going to leverage some automated processes to detect change between the two data sets, 2020 and 2022, as well as just some automated uh, classification, even of just the imagery there. So we can see there's some obvious blowdown in the middle there. Uh, it doesn't seem like a very big stretch for us to be able to, to have uh, our mapping software try to try to draw some of these polygons for us. Uh, once we're, we're confident that we've mapped uh, some stands that have been blown down, we can use those EFI volumes to, to get volume attached, which can then be used for product volumes or tons of carbon lost, whatever uh, translation is of interest there. Uh, that'll also let us start looking for trends as to see which types of stands were more, more readily damaged, uh, try to adapt to, to the next storm, because we know it's coming. All right, so to summarize, uh, PEI has acquired new photography and LIDAR in 2020 and a full wall-to-wall -wall enhanced forest inventory for the first time uh, in 2022. We are still looking for ways to use and, and leverage those new forest metrics, uh, but we have begun counting volume lost to wind and are working on applying that for the full uh, forest in the province. And that is it. I'll leave it there for this morning open that up to any questions anyone has. So that was a very quick look, not very deep dive, but uh, that's what PEI has been working on this year. Thank you so much for that update, Matt. It's, uh, it's pretty wild to look at those those pictures before and after. It's, uh, it's a big, big challenge to try to quantify that. Uh, it's good to, that you have your enhanced force inventory to help you along the way. Uh, exactly. So do we have any questions for Matt in the audience? I don't even know how I can see those. Sharon, if you can help us. 
Okay, so what type of GPS system was used to locate your plots, Matt? A question from uh, Cameron. Uh, yeah, we use a uh, Allegro 2 handheld with, uh, we've got an Aero GNSS system. It's a kind of a cell phone size little box, external GPS. Uh, what does it do? It, I believe it uses the real-time kinetic uh, correction, I guess it's called. Uh, but yeah, it's from, it's the Aero 100, I believe is the make and model of the thing. Now we have a question from Piotr. Uh, why is the EFI stored as a point layer and not a, as a raster? Good question. And uh, maybe my colleague Andrew can help with that more of the GIS. Uh, it may have, because there's so many attributes, not really sure. It can be both, I guess, but we're using it as a point, uh, using it as the points at the moment. Okay, now we have uh, David asking a question. Uh, do the general public request digital surfaces uh, such as the hill surface shade model or canopy height models, et cetera? Uh, definitely the surfaces. Uh, we don't get a lot of requests for forest specific stuff like a canopy height model. I can't say that anyone's asked me for a canopy height model or uh, any of these EFI metrics. Um, we'll make them available to landowners on their own spot, same as our traditional forest inventory, uh, but very few requests for forest stuff. Uh, surface models, absolutely. All right, awesome. And we have some clarification here from Andrew for uh, Piotr uh, oh, there, uh, that uh, it, the, the point layer will be converted to a roster at a later date. Uh, another question for from Cameron. Uh, did you have val uh, uh, did you have a validation process to test accuracy of predictions? If so, what kind of accuracies uh, did you achieve on volumes? Uh, we are still working on that one, Cameron. Um, probably. Uh, yeah, so we, we're still testing the accuracy of those. We're we're moving ahead with uh, looking at them and, and pulling the numbers out, but not reporting on it. As, so we can't can't really say the accuracy yet. Uh, to be de to be determined. Awesome. Well, they'll be next year for sure. Uh, yeah. And uh, Byron says uh, asks is the is your two hundred uh, twenty twenty EFI backwards compatible with your twenty ten polygon uh, polygonal inventory. I'm uh, not really sure what you mean, Byron, by backwards compatible. Like, uh, so is your your two, 2010 inventory compatible with your EFI that you're getting now and delivered in 2022 that I you mean, acquired in 2020? I like in terms of tools and techniques, I guess is there any compatibility? Yeah, well, the like the the just the straight up spatial stuff, the polygon. Uh, we can apply the EFI to those to those uh, shapes from 2010 uh did you you can you quantify changes through time of certain forest attributes? i don't think we don't have the forest attributes of, of from 2010 so much in those same spots hmm. okay uh david so young here you. asked the question i may have missed it did you employ random forest to build the predictive models for the inventory metrics I can't say exactly what the vendor did, uh, what their method was. I probably, I, certainly, I don't know that one off the top of my head, but we didn't, I, I know we didn't do it. We didn't uh, build it like that. Okay. Uh, Amir Roche here says, asks, how were the tree plots spatially distributed? Um, how do we define their locations according to the forest landscape? How were the tree plots spatially distributed? Uh, they're on a on a grid on a random grid. Uh, any that fell in the forest were the ones we kept. Threw out the ones that we didn't. Uh, how do we define their locations according to the forest landscape? I'm not sure exactly sure what that means either. Um, I think uh, the PI was just on the grid, and if it fell in the forest, it was quantified, right? Uh, so yeah, example. That's, that's exactly if it's in the forest, and we, yeah, we could get, we can get to every bit of forest uh, by foot. Yeah. 
All right. So one last question here before we have to move on. Um, how many hectares uh, is you is your study area from April? Uh, so it was. So we did it for the whole province, which was fifty seven hundred square kilometers, five hundred and seventy thousand hectares. Uh, the forest area is just over half of that, uh, two hundred and sixty thousand hectares ish. Oh, yeah, I did say it was the last question, <laughs> but they keep on coming in. Okay, so maybe one last one. We're still ahead of time. So uh, using the stats from the point cloud and applying PCA is the great way to distribute ground plots. Oh, that's an uh, insight from David. So uh, for to, to all who are listening. Uh, what so is thank, PCA in that context? Uh, principal component analyses. Okay. Uh, so it's a, it's a way of breaking down, I guess, multi-dimensional uh, multi space into two dimensionals uh, or two dimensions or sphere dimensions. Um, Great. So, yeah, excuse, so thank you very much, Matt, for, for that, that overview. It was really insightful. Great. Thank you. So next coming up, we have Oliver, who's going to give us um, a presentation on e using EFI for regional assessments of above ground tree biomass and carbon stocks in Newfoundland, I believe. Yes. Um, let me just try and see if I can get this. Is that uh, showing the screen? Uh, there we go. Oh, yes, indeed. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, thanks, uh, thanks, Pez, for the introduction. Um, Oliver Van Leer here, remote sensing specialist with the Canadian Wood Fiber Center, um, located in Western Newfoundland. So, I guess initially, um, Boyd would have been solicited um, to give a presentation today. So Boyd Pittman is the supervisor of forest inventory um, here in Newfoundland, but he sort of asked me to fill in here with um, some of the work that we've been doing, some of the research we've been doing um, that uses uh, EFI for regional assessments of above ground tree biomass and carbon um, stocks. All right. So, um, Carbon is stored in uh, five different pools in forest ecosystems. Um, you know, that includes soils. Um, and moving up, you got the below ground biomass, you know, your roots, um, ground litter, um, which would include fallen leaves and stems. And then we have our deadwood. And the focus of today's talk is going to be on above ground biomass. So the whole different components of the tree. So stem bark, branches, um, foliage, and stem wood. So carbon stocks, they can be calculated using coarse estimates of, uh, I think it was roughly 50% um, of the estimated above ground biomass or from ele allometric models, sorry. Um, the accurate estimates of the carbon in the forests, well, they're needed so that we can better understand um, its role in the carbon cycle. Um, the estimation of the individual components, um, however, can provide more information when it comes to management decisions. So for example, knowing the bark and the branch biomass um, can provide an inventory for bioenergy production. Um, knowing the biomass of a canopy component is important for many wildfire models. Um, so there's various uh, approaches or various sources of data, I should say, that can be used to estimate biomass across the landscape. So when it comes to satellite images, we can estimate biomass using optical sensors and uh, base our estimates on, you know, derived vegetation indices or spectral bands, um, because biomass is strongly correlated with uh, the reflectances in the near infrared and red um, channels. But uh, that, that comes with challenges. Um, surface reflectances that are correlated to biomass tend to saturate um, when biomass reaches larger quantities. So we're only really getting uh, more accurate estimates in these lower values here. And you can see by the scatter plot here that the higher values are not being well um, predicted. They're being underestimated. And that's that saturation effect that I'm referring to. Um, it also being passive. Um, these optical sensors, you know, are going to need cloud-free um, and, and haze-free days to collect uh, good data, I guess. There's also active remote sensing um, technology like uh, radar, um, and that does have some advantages. So, for instance, microwaves, um, they can penetrate through clouds and vegetation, but we still have been observing the same issue of saturation. So they 
signal saturate in these um, higher areas of biomass. So that implies um, that we're often underestimating the biomass in the areas that have the most um, using satellite imagery alone. Another active sensor, um, pretty much the hot topic today is, uh, well, in today's seminar anyways, light, light LIDAR, sorry. Um, so light detection and raging. As we all know, um, these won't have that same saturation effect, and that's because LIDAR measures you know, forest height and structure quite accurately, and biomass is obviously very correlated with um, height and structure of the forest. So when it's mounted on an airborne platform, um, the data can be used um, to support and produce enhanced forest inventories, as we commonly refer to them. Um, since it can, however, be cost prohibitive, and that is one of the big limitations here in Newfoundland, is that there are just no funds to roll out an operational um, EFI because the LIDAR, the airborne LIDAR just can't be acquired. Um, so it's not always an option um, to be able to report on large areas or for repeat measures uh, using an EFI. LIDAR can also be mounted on satellites. Um, and it's not necessarily a new concept. I won't get into the whole history of the technology or its applications, but uh, for today's talk, when I'll be referring to spaceborne LIDAR, I'll be um, talking about the one that's mounted on the International Space Station, and that's JEDI, which uh, stands for Global Ecosystems Dynamics Investigation. So that LIDAR was specifically designed to sample forest structure um, to support global biomass assessments at resolutions that support uh, monitoring and reporting. So since this may be new um, to some, uh, I thought I'd go over a few slides very quickly, um, give a high, high level overview because um, not all LIDAR data is equal. Um, so this Spaceborne LIDAR is, is quite different um, than the data that's collected from a plane. Um, it's basically spatially discontinuous. Um, so it uses three lasers here to produce eight laser beams, um, which create shots roughly every 60 meters in the long track direction and uh, 600 meters uh, across on the uh, latitudinal track. Um, so it's, it's really just sampling the earth um, every time it, it goes around. And since it's continuously sampling, you can combine you know, multiple acquisitions from multiple orbits um, to increase those sampling densities. Um, what the data looks like, it actually, you know, one pulse has a footprint of 25 meters on the ground. Um, you know, when you talk about airborne LIDAR, we're looking at more around half a meter. So there's a big, big difference there. Um, so yeah, the JEDI only collects sort of the actual waveforms. Um, and from that, um, there's a whole suite of products that have been derived. Um, it's been processed to provide sort of canopy height metrics and uh, profile metrics from each of those pulses. Um, and there's other data products as well um, that include sort of footprint and gridded data sets of not only the metrics, but also um, gridded above ground biomass density. So just quickly on what that biomass um, product, how it was developed, was basically um, the models were developed with crowdsourced calibration data. Um, and you can sort of see the sources of the data that developed those models, um, especially here with the black circles. Um, and the estimates were then derived at a one kilometer um, grid cell here. So you can see that these, the, the calibration data was mainly collected from the tropical and temperate forests. So it would be worthwhile um, if you're planning on using this locally, like here in Newfoundland, where there have been no data to support those models um, to develop some locally calibrated models. So our goal was to sort of, uh, well, we wanted to gain some insights on how to produce the most accurate and uh, precise predictions of individual biomass components using enhanced forest inventory and these emerging remote sensing technologies. So just a, a quick background. Um, so when it's not feasible to sort of acquire LIDAR for a large, large area, um, we can scale up um, our EFIs. So 
we basically extend our enhanced force inventory predictions beyond our area of uh, airborne LIDAR using spatially comprehensive layers, which can include satellite um, information like we've previously seen, but also environmental uh, topographical layers, um, any spatially comprehensive predictors that we'd like. So in a previous research here, we demonstrated that um, using an indirect approach or a two-phased model um, where we produce EFI attributes using the ground plots and the LIDAR data, and then use these predictions as surrogate plots to drive the models um, and calibrate the model story with our spatially comprehensive layers to produce maps for our larger area. And we've done that with uh, fairly good results. And it actually, there, there are benefits in doing this sort of two-phased indirect approach. Um, model performances are better than going directly from the ground plots to these spatially comprehensive layers. So once we've predicted basically a value for each of our 20 meter cells, what we're working at here across the whole landscape by extending these LIDAR predictions, we can infer sort of a population estimate, so a mean value for our um, land base or our management area. But the problem with this approach is that it sort of ignores any model error um, that would have been carried through or propagated up from the first phase model, the LIDAR models. And well, if the uncertainty uh, at one stage of a two-phased modeling approach is ignored, then the overall uncertainty of the model is, is really unknown. And the variance that's associated to your final um, estimate is likely to be you know, significantly underestimated. Um, research recently has proposed um, a generalized hierarchical model-based inference framework, and that was Sarela who proposed this here, uh, which accounts for uncertainties from both modeling phases. So it doesn't affect the actual population estimate because it's the same um, model that's being implemented, but the associated variances and the standard errors now become reliable because they take into account um, both the error sort of propagated from the first model into the second. So our objectives here um, in what I'm presenting today is basically to compare sort of the performance of three two phase models constructed with uh, airborne LIDAR and spatially comprehensive layers. In the third scenario, scenario four would be with the airborne LIDAR and the spaceborne uh, LIDAR data, JEDI. And the fifth scenario is with the LIDAR data and uh, combination of both. Uh, we also implemented um, two sort of benchmark um, approaches. So just ground plus with the uh, airborne LIDAR, uh, so sort of basically your EFI and your ground plots with um, the spatially comprehensive layers, just for comparison purposes more than anything else. So we capitalized on a data set that we acquired um, through the AWARE project in 2016. You can see in black here the area of LiDAR coverage. Um, our ground plots sort of distributed within that area. The larger area where we're trying to get some, uh, some estimates to report on uh, carbon and biomass. And in green, um, sort of the uh, usable JEDI data that was available. So just quickly, those scenarios that we saw earlier, this is more of a visual representation to uh, drive it home, I guess. Um, we implemented our allometric models using species, DBH and height, sort of at the individual tree level. Um, and from those biomass components at the tree level, we summarized them at the plot level. And from this, from these plot estimates, then we can produce our first scenario or benchmark with the airborne LIDAR, so our EFI right here, that we can use as surrogate plots to then develop our models with these following three scenarios. And it was also this um, other scenario that looks at just the plots with um, the spatially comprehensive layers directly. So we're trying to find out sort of what the best performing scenario is and also look at um, the generalized hierarchical model-based inference framework in comparison with just a simple hierarchical model-based approach, which is basically just the uh, the simple two-phase approach that didn't take into account the uncertainty um, from the first model in the predictions of the second. So the results, um, basically, if we take a closer look, now we can see uh, most of what we're looking at here is the direct approaches. So on the top here are um, 
models developed solely with the uh, airborne LIDAR. We have total biomass, bark component, branch, foliage, and wood. And on the bottom here are spatially comprehensive layers. Um, so even from the LIDAR, we can see that uh, there's something missing um, to better characterize the branch and the foliage uh, components from the ALS protectors. And that's even more apparent uh, with the spatially comprehensive layers, um, you know, where the saturation effect here is really obvious across all um, attributes. But nonetheless, I mean, even with these results here from the airborne LIDAR, we did that these models were um, sufficiently accurate to use in our scaling up approach in the scenarios three, four, and five. So the results of those uh, three, four, five scenarios, um, indirect approaches were uh, variable, um, depending on the attribute that we look at. So we had roughly, I think, 2,000 Jedi footprints um, with coincident airborne LIDAR, where we sort of applied the airborne LIDAR models to those locations. And at the top here, we have the models developed with the spatially comprehensive layers uh, in the middle, the Jedi only, and then the combination of the two at the end here. So the saturation effect is still quite obvious um, with the spatially comprehensive layers sort of across all attributes where we're missing those higher, um, higher, higher estimates of biomass under, under, under uh, estimating them, sorry. And the using Jedi does offer some improvements, um, you know, from 69 to 78, R square, 60 to 63. Um, so there are some improvements except for foliage here, which appears to be better explained um, from the spatially comprehensive layers than with the uh, structural information from Jedi. But overall, uh, we consistently can see some improvements in the R squares, so highest R squares associated to the models that were developed using the combination of those data sources. We are still, however, sort of under underrepresenting um, some of these lower classes here are not always being um, well well uh, predicted either from from Jedi. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. So spatially comprehensive layers, yeah, we're, we're sort of satur seeing saturation effect in those higher volumes and from Jedi, it was interesting to see that it was more on those lower values that were, were getting over predicted. But it seems that it sort of gets um, smoothed out a bit uh, when we use the combination of the two data sets. Um, so just to put this in a those scatter plots sort of in just so we can see the um, the changes in the model fit in the R square and the RMSC. So at a glance, um, this first row here is basically just basically comprehensive layers, um, the R squares from the Jedi, and whoops, and I made a scribble there by accident. And the last one here would be the combination of the two, but we're seeing improvements in R square, you know, almost to, to point two, and that's for the for the wood um, component. So it's not negligible, you know, and decrease in in RMSEs, you know, up to almost nine percent. So when it comes to regional assessments, so that was sort of on model performance on, you know, the type of data that we wanted to use. Um, but if we're looking at um, sort of producing regional assessments, um, so population mean for forest management district uh, 15 was that large area that I was showing for is going to be um, the same uh, if we use either the general hierarchical model based inference approach or the um, direct uh, simplified HMB approach, which didn't take into account the uncertainty of the um, interim airborne LIDAR model. So the population estimates are gonna be the same, um, but what changes, however, is the variance that's associated to those estimates. So the solid lines are basically the GHMB approach and the dotted lines, the um, the two-phase approach without taking into account the error propagation. So we can see that uh, we have underestimations from al almost 95% when we use the uh, simplified HMB approach and don't account for the uncertainty of the ALS models in our final prediction. So here on the left, we can see um, the proportion of the uncertainty in the variance 
is associated to the airborne LIDAR models, and that's going to be uh, in colored here. And the remaining um, from the second model is going to be in gray. So we can see that for some instances here, um, almost up to 99% of the final variance is attributed to the uncertainty um, that was found associated to the uh, airborne lighter models. Um, so that's quite high. Um, but you sort of wonder, you know, how can we introduce so much uncertainty? You know, our EFIs are known to be accurate, you know, the LIDAR measure structure so precisely, but this is actually a bit misleading because in this instant, instance here, it's because our ALS models had such a small sample size um, in comparison to our second model, which was you know the whole forest management district 15, um, which had a very large sample size or a large land base. So the variability in that population was well captured. Um, all the models were actually Quite precise, you know. Regardless if we use the GHMB approach or not, you can see here the standard errors are all pretty much the relative standard errors are below four percent, which is actually quite good. Um, but we did underestimate the standard error by not accounting for the variance um, of the intermediate airborne lidar model by as much as ninety percent here. When you're looking at the branch component um, and comparing to the GHMB approach. So the approaches that I sort of showed today, the GHMB approach with, um, with either other data sources can be implemented um, for various mapping units. You know, the results presented today were focused around the whole forest management district, but it's possible to drive those estimates for smaller um, mapping units, sort of like a yeah, sub watershed here or a watershed or at a one kilometer grid. Um, sort of like those JEDI um, biomass products. As long as there's sort of sufficient um, JEDI data within your mapping unit, um, then you're going to be able to produce an estimate and associated variance. Um, there's also the advantage that associated to each polygon um, or, or mapping unit or grid unit, you can also um, have an associated standard error and a prediction interval. Um, so having these error estimates sort of spatialized can highlight, you know, the stratas that have been under underperforming and it may require some additional field sampling. And uh, yeah, so I guess this was sort of a, a proof of concept. You know, I'm sure the Jedi won't be the last um, satellite with, uh, with LIDAR on it. So we'll probably see more of that in the years to come and, and greater need for this hierarchical model-based uh, inference taken into account the uh, uncertainty of our intermediate models. And uh, that's it. Yes, I'd like to acknowledge um, you know, Jean-Francois Côté and Mathieu Fortin, who have been working on this as well with me from the Canadian Wood Fiber Centre. And uh, yeah, that's it. Go to any questions. Thank you, Oliver. That was a lot of information. It's super <laughs> encouraging, though, uh, to see that, that progress and, and the proof of concept. Um, so are there any questions for Oliver? We may have time for one or two. I mean, there are none that pop up. I, my, my first question was, uh, how, how far are you from the, the plug and play approach? Uh, I know this is more of a research, but uh, is there, is it still? We're, we're working on it. We're, uh, one of the goals was to develop sort of an R package, um, okay. which could make this implementation a bit more user friendly, because uh, I think there is, you know, a lot of value into um, being able to do more with, with less. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, so we have a, Chris, a question here from Chris. Uh, going back to your grid of scatter plots, any thoughts as to why branch biomass models had higher R squared value compared to the other components, even wood and total biomass? Um, let's see now. Going back to your grid of scatter plots, any thoughts as to why branch biomass had higher R squares? 73. Yeah, it does. Um, no, no insight on that. Uh, <laughs> sorry, but, uh, but that is a, a good observation. Okay, so then we'll move on to Jean Martin, who says, uh, Oliver, any written reports yet to chew on? I remember I, I saw a few DOIs uh, during your your, um, your presentation. Yeah, so I guess um, not specifically related to this, but I mean, well, in a sense, there's the uh, the GHMB approach by uh, Sarella that that's published works. She has an R package out there as well. Um, 
I'm not sure if it will allow you to spatialize um, your products, but it does take into account sort of the, that whole idea of error propagation. Um, and then recently there was a paper published um, with Mathieu Fortin as the co as the as the lead author. It does take this sort of concept, um, but applies it to um, growth uh, predictions using sort of a, a growth model and then applying that to um, satellite imagery. Um, so I could share that with you, Jean Martin, but we are working on uh, trying to get something out to summarize this and make it accessible. Thank you, Oliver. Uh, now we'll move on to uh, Ian, for, who's going to give us uh, an update from Ontario. Oh, Ian, the stage is yours if you want to share your screen. Sure thing. Oh, that's great. You can see that. And just let me go to full up here. Perfect. Excellent. You can hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you and we can see your presentation power and presentation mode. Excellent. Okay. Thanks everyone for uh, joining today. I know uh, across the province, there's uh, in Ontario, there's quite a few folks that look forward to this session. So uh, it's a great honor to be uh, the, one of the folks here to, to speak about uh, progress of uh, some of the inventory applications in Ontario. So um, we'll get started here. Uh, presentation outline for today is, is to kind of highlight um, some updates as to where we are in various states of, of the inventory production process for our T2 or our, our term two inventory, um, as well as kind of highlighting some of the, uh, the data management um, aspects of uh, the, the data products that we're currently integrating into that T2 inventory. So, um, so yeah, we got lots to, to kind of touch upon. Um, probably need more than 15 minutes, but anyways, we'll, we'll give you a nice overview of, uh, of where we're at right now. Um, so in terms of acquisition, uh, we're rolling into year five of uh, acquisition. We're sitting at about 300,000 square kilometers of, of data. Um, so we're sitting uh, somewhere in the ballpark of about one and a half million tiles of, of LiDAR information in terms of classified products and interactive products that have come in. So um, we're about 150,000, 55,000 square kilometers shy of uh, the target of, of finishing uh, the area that you see kind of outlined um, in gray up in the, on the screen. And that kind of leaves us with about 23 forest management units uh, complete with, uh, with full LiDAR. Um, the field sampling program that supports the LIDAR and some of our other uh, monitoring programs uh, in the province is, is referred to as the Vegetation Sampling Network. Um, it's structurally guided by LIDAR. Uh, we're using a principal components analysis um, approach to locate the plots. Um, within those plots, there's a, a three module um, uh, plot type. So there's an A plot that kind of supports general ABA characteristics of um, you know, measuring the number of trees, species, uh, diameter, heights, and, and so forth. Um, then there's the B plots that, that are a little more in depth than an additional module that captures stem mapping. And then there's the C plots that would capture some downwoody debris transect and uh, small shrubs and, and small trees. So we've got an integration of uh, three different plot types uh, to kind of support the FRI modeling, but also to support um, some of our monitoring programs. Uh, this year we're looking to, to integrate in the, the SGSR package um, that uh, Tristan Goodbody uh, has been working on. Uh, so that's further development on that PCA analysis piece that we started with um, at the start of the cycle that was put together by, by Martin Quenick. So um, excellent tool. Uh, we'll put a little plug in um, at the bottom and there's a link there if, if anyone wants to follow up with it. Um, that started as a, as a KTTD project with, with our forestry uh, Forest Resource Inventory Research Area. Um, another KTTD project was developing a data collection app, um, and we've done some further exploration work on that um, in terms of developing it to um, integrate with the, the Microsoft Azure Cloud Platform. So um, it's an app that can be used to collect those, those A, B, and C plot types in the field, and um, it was developed in, in Xamarin by, by Foresight to um, support data collection um, and uh, kind of speed up 
um, our shift from collecting data on paper, because as we started this cycle with LIDAR, Ontario was still collecting a lot of our plot data on, on paper. So uh, that that data collection app has been uh, evolving over the years, and we're excited to um, be able to, to roll it out and, and look at these um, modifications that we've been working on this past year. So today we've, we have 13 forest management units that we've acquired our plots on. So we're sitting just shy of, uh, I believe, 2,600 plots um, that support the, the BSN uh, sampling network. Uh, part of that sampling network is collecting some 360 photos. So this is kind of a, a neat thing just to kind of highlight. Um, they're very useful in terms of the modeling, uh, looking at the understory, um, just trying to, to, to relate to different tiers of, of points and what might be being, what's captured in that plot, whether, um, you know, some of the plot data is, is um, it just kind of helps you figure out your, your position in the plot with the, with the plot data with, with the photos. So it's been very useful. Um, we have run into a few challenges with it um, in terms of managing the volume of data. So this was a little project that we worked on this year was to um, kind of break those 360 photos down into um, cubes and, uh, Microsoft um, was helpful uh, with uh, supporting us on, on uh, breaking those photos down and then also um, developing some uh, basic uh, AI uh, applications to uh, be able to manage the photos uh, and the sheer volume of, of data that was coming in, in terms of the uh, photos. They're not big in size, but it's just the sheer number of photos that we were um, having to, to look after. So using the AI approach, um, we're able to tag the photos, um, scan them for objects, and, and that AI algorithm can tell us whether we're looking at forestry, uh, what the probabilities are, whether it's tropical forest or boreal forest. And, and these are pretty basic at this point. We're, we're still kind of working on this, this process, but uh, pretty exciting to see the application of AI as it um, allows us to, to identify photos that have human faces in. We don't know who the, the person is, but we certainly know that there is a face in it and that helps us kind of stratify that data and filter it out so that we're not releasing, you know, personal information within our, our open data set. Uh, and it also helps us scan for kind of unintended images in the data set. So, you know, that classic picture of the side of the truck or the steering wheel or, or something like that. So we can remove those photos, you know, quickly from the, from the data set. And then in, we're into the process of kind of tagging them and naming them and, and checking the, uh, the, load, the load process as well on, on that side of the, uh, the data integration piece. So um, kind of an exciting project. Um, I think there's a lot more we can do on this front, but just to see the initial uh, development of uh, the AI side on, on the QAQC process has been uh, you know, really, uh, really welcoming and, and an exciting project. Uh, shifting back to kind of the, the forest inventory production, uh, we finally we've wrapped up our, our four forest management units with the draft area-based approach. Uh, this was another uh, of our KTTD projects to kind of develop a process for single photon LIDAR. Um, first projects were to kind of evaluate the fit of single photon LIDAR with, with some of the traditional linear mode ABA models. Uh, now it's it's kind of rolling out a uh, production process to work with single photon LIDAR, which is running at about 25 points per meter um, versus you know, some of the, the lesser amounts. Um, and what we found is we had great success in, in running these pilot projects on, on a virtual machine environment, but to roll this up to meet the, the, the bands of, of the timing of forest management planning and, and the number of inventories that are due, we, we needed to kind of scale the processing elements of ABA um, away from virtual machine and, and into more of a, uh, a cluster-based uh, parallel process. So that's something we've been working on over the past year is um, we have a fairly large development project with Microsoft and uh, Databricks to um, kind of take our existing, um, most of it's R-based code, some of it's Python, but to, to kind of wrap that in Python and, and roll that into a a parallel process cluster-based um, processing environment. And uh, we're using Databricks as, as kind of the, uh, the basis for housing the data. So that, that allows us um, uh, good access to the data points and then also allows us to deploy uh, pipeline-based parallel processing. So we're still using a lot of our traditional packages that you'd expect to find like LiDAR um, and, and so forth in, in your ABA scripts. Uh, those are still referenced in that, that 
Databricks in, in the pipeline environment. Um, so we're still able to use some of the similar tools. So for those that saw the presentation last year, this was one of our, our slides that was rolling this out and being able to process you know, anywhere from 5,000 to 10,000 tiles. Um, some of these steps took you know, a couple of days. Some of these steps took three to four weeks, depending on where we were in the process. And that's where we wanted to kind of start to streamline the processing um, to make it a little bit easier to integrate more people into the production process and also um, kind of reduce the, the processing time. So producing the metrics um, was, was one, of the, um, one of the timing um, constraints that we were trying, to, trying to, to solve with this virtual machine environment. Uh, also working with Microsoft, we've looked to kind of structure our, our data solution um, from start to finish. And so this is kind of the architecture that, that we've been working to um, fill out. Um, so you can see on the far left side, we've got an ingest zone with field plot data, satellite images, uh, LIDAR all kind of being ingested into that, that cloud platform. So we can provide a URL to, uh, to stakeholders and, and clients if we want to ingest data and have them load data into the container. And then we're able to run uh, a series of pipeline checks on the data inputs, which you know starts to move that data into what we would call the raw zone. And, that's kind of where all of our long-term original data files would sit. And then we move, start to move that data into the analysis portion where we start to enrich the data where we're doing our modeling and uh, development work. So um, once that's published into our inventory data, then we can curate that along with objects or, or products like uh, derivatives and so forth into uh, the curated zone and distribute that, um, which currently right now GeoHub is our, is you know one of our avenues to disseminate some of that uh, information. So you can see at the bottom, the general structure is store the data in the Delta Lake. Um, that allows us to you know deploy um, a number of different approaches. Uh, the code that we've been developing in R over the past few years can be um, built into that Databricks um, environment to support the parallel processing and data scientists and so forth and those then can be published into pipelines which are uh, run in that microsoft uh, data factory type of environment so you can deploy um, pipelines and um, automate some of the processes that you know would have taken a single step in the vm world we can migrate those into you know specific qaqc pipelines or um, you know, a, a, which, which may include QAQC. If the QAQC checks out, then it goes through a, a data compression um, in the case of the full last tile. So they would go from ingest to raw where they're compressed. The raw, the original data gets, you know, archived as, as the file that it came in as, and then the compressed version kind of moves into the enriched zone and so forth to kind of work through that, that data flow. So this is a uh, kind of an exciting thing that we've been working on. It's taken, uh, taken a, a fair bit of effort, um, not just from the FRI program, but from our uh, land resources cluster and, and Microsoft and folks at Databricks. So it's been a real team effort to um, be able to, to pull this uh, project together and just, we're starting to see some, some excellent results from it. Um, kind of shifting, another kind of key research area that we've been working on over the past year um, with uh, Ethan Berman out of uh, UBC is looking at, uh, whether or not we can use segmentation and some imputation models to kind of assess our, our T1 inventory polys that were photo interpreted and assess those polys against um, some of the, uh, well, we, we've kind of looked at a number of different uh, LIDAR derivatives, or, or sorry, metrics to, to assess that data against. And so we've, he, we kind of came up with, with a P95 um, crown, crown cover and, and, uh, and um, coefficient of variation as, as kind of the, the main metrics to be able to assess this. Um, the general region merging segmentation algorithm is, is something that appears to be working very well out of the different segmentation al algorithms that were evaluated. And uh, stay tuned, he'll have a paper that, that hopefully is, is published soon that, that will kind of highlight some of the, the key aspects of, of this project. But nonetheless, what we found was um, some really interesting results in terms of, um, of of comparisons between the photo interpretation on this particular study site and the the, um, 
the general region merging algorithm. So I don't want to steal all this thunder, but you know, essentially we've seen uh, this as a, a kind of a useful tool to be able to assess some of the photo and terp uh, polygons against um, the LIDAR data. And, and just to kind of highlight a quick visual of, of comparison, um, there are some some very interesting um, very interesting um, statistical and visual um, comparisons um, within this uh, within this data set and this approach. So we're hoping that we we can further operationally test this and then use this uh, process to figure out how we which polygons we need to, to provide specific attention to and in, in updating an, an inventory versus those that, that may have a good statistical fit and may not require as much um, update effort. Uh, on the data access front, um, we've been really successful in terms of um, pushing our data out to um, out to uh, a web viewer. So we're able to kind of start to migrate away from hard drive dissemination services, which has been really key. Um, so we've got a few links that have gone up. They're, they're still in kind of a beta format at this point, but uh, nonetheless, with our data in the cloud and um, the, the geo hub up and running uh, there'll be be some future links official links released to start to open up the access to uh, the SPL data and the derivatives so there's some download links through a GP uh, KJ file so a geo package uh, as well as some WCS and WMS services um, for LIDAR and, and some of the T1 imagery that was uh, required uh, just to kind of keep moving along uh, we're still working on integration of some of the, um, we have some natural disturbance processes that were um, established in Google Earth Engine and we've been um, looking at ways to integrate uh, that into um, the uh, Microsoft planetary compute environment uh, and integrate that into that, that Databricks environment uh, that we were looking at in the, uh, the overview image. And uh, also the, the same with some of the, um, the opportunities to look at some of the data science and machine learning and, and AI aspects of once the data is in that that Databricks environment, we can start to deploy some other uh, analytic tools um, from a data science perspective. And that brings us uh, kind of to near the end of the presentation. But um, overall, our, our goal still as a province is to 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 try to push push our inventory products to uh, a place where we can leverage past inventory investments and and then look to to find ideal places to spend new investments. So we're looking to build upon our existing data sets. So finding tools that we can evaluate, you know, existing photo and turf polygons and update those polygons with with new information is key. Um, also getting the data into that that data science analytics environment is is also a key one where we can start to to really look at um, machine learning and, and other analytic tools to uh, link our, our field plot samples, our satellite data, and our LiDAR data products, um, and integrate that into um, an inventory product. So, so this, is, uh, this is by no means our, our map forward, but it's certainly a, a, a broad, uh, kind of a broad overview of, of where we're at in terms of, of trying to put pieces together to to produce a more continuous or evergreen type of inventory. And that brings me to the end of the presentation. Um, I know I probably went a little bit over, but um, thanks thanks for your attention. And uh, we can hopefully answer a couple of questions here. That was fantastic. I wasn't going to cut you off, Ian. <laughs> uh, so we have a question here already popped up. Uh, uh, what is the cost projected per hectare for acquisition to product delivery? Oh, that's a good one. From... <laughs> it varies. Um, yeah, <laughs> it varies. Um, I would say at this point in time, yeah. I don't even know if I could answer that question right now. <laughs> I could probably scratch my head a little bit and get back to you, but you know, we could certainly try to answer that for you. All right, Robert, you'll probably have to email Ian for, for more yeah. in-depth answer. Um, Alex asks here, thanks Ian. Uh, will the R code be released in a package or GitHub to allow people to understand how the ABA is being generated? Uh, yeah, like any of our 
code developed in KTTD. I believe we've been publishing most of that code. So it, yeah, we can make, make the code available. Um, most of the code that we use is based on peer reviewed science that's already been done in Ontario. So um, if you dig through some of the past projects um, that have been published, you should be able to find uh, you know, a lot of, the, a lot of the, the math behind it. So, but certainly we can make that available. That's great. Um, unless there's any other questions for the moment, then we'll uh, probably move on to our next speaker. So thank you very much, Ian. Oh, thank here you. we go. One, one more question, just because it popped up. On the polygon comparison slide, which was which? Oh, the polygon of the force inventory with the aerial interp and the... Um, yeah, so the yeah. photo interps on the left and the, uh, the, the general region merging uh, algorithm is on the right-hand side. Okay, and then um, I'll read these last comments. So, Ian, in the presentation workflow, what does data enrichment mean? With that, uh, I guess up a few. Yeah, there we go. Uh, where see From raw to enrichment after analyze after being analyzed okay yeah so raw would be um we've received more or less the raw data from the from the source uh, so we've ingested it we've made sure that the data is clean um it's complete so we're checking you know the number of files match the formats are the way they're supposed to be delivered like contract deliverables or uh, etc then raw is essentially um storing that data but uh, and then the enriched zone is is any kind of processing that's being done to the data. So if we're starting to develop LIDAR metrics, for example, that would be an example of an enriched um, data product. Okay, and last question goes to Robert, who says, uh, PEI achieved a timeline of LIDAR acquisition to product delivery for 570,000 hectares or no, 57,000 hectares, maybe there's a zero missing, uh, of two years. Uh, has Ontario been able to attain a similar timeline or is it comparing apples and oranges? Uh, well, I'd say we're, we're probably a little bit slower in terms of development, but we're we're trying to build a process to essentially handle just under 2.3 million tiles of data. So we're uh, we've got a, and we got a lot of data to 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 work with here. But certainly, um, once this solution is in place for pillow processing, um, you know we can certainly analyze thousands of tiles of data in hours rather than weeks. So um, I think we should be able to um, process inventories much better than we have in the past. Well, thank you so much, Ian, for all this information. I really like uh, your, your, your solution architecture and, and, and big picture, um, sharing your big picture of where you're going with the province. It's, it's great to hear. Um, so with that, we'll probably move on to our next speaker. Um, and we are heading to Saskatchewan with Lane. So Lane, whenever you're ready, you can share your presentation. Perfect. Thank you, Pez. Thank you. Okay, so this was easy yesterday and this morning. <laughs> <laughs> the share button is that green one. And then you have to determine which of your screens you want to share. Oh, there we go. It's doing something. Okay. Okay. So hopefully you can see a um, presentation mode and we can hear you loud and clear. And you can hear me even better. Um, great. So uh, thank you, Pez. Thanks, uh, Ian. Uh, it's always difficult to come after Ontario um, and feel like you're accomplishing much. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm Lane. I'm the provincial forester, uh, inventory forester for Saskatchewan, and, and I've had the pleasure of speaking to this forum for the past five years. And in those five years, I've been speaking about our attempts to operationalize a new forest resource inventory for Saskatchewan. And uh, Matt, thank you for setting the bar for statistics. I can't tell you how many trees we've measured in the past five years. Um, but I can tell you that when I'm out in the field, I think probably too many. And when I get back to the office, I know I'm thinking, geez, just not enough. So some things never change. Um, <clears throat> so I'm pleased to tell you that as of last week, we've published data for 17 million hectares 
that's one quarter of the area of the province of Saskatchewan and half of our provincial forest. And that includes all of the working forests south of the Churchill River, which really dis differentiates sort of the, the area of interest for forestry for, um, for the area that's uh, more suited for um, wilderness and, and maybe some mining. Uh, our FRI is a little bit different than the EFI you've heard about elsewhere. Um, we package it into four broad themes. The first theme is land cover, and that's a classification of the forest into 11 types, ranging from upland forest to shrubby wetlands uh, to lakes, and that's all done at a 10 meter raster pixel. Uh, that's complemented by rasters showing the percent softwood and the percent crown cover. Um, and this theme is now complete and to steal a term from Ontario for the area of the undertaking. Our terrain theme is a five meter digital terrain model typically derived from a combination of satellite and air photo DSM, which you can see um, on the, in the top uh, circle image and the sky forest system which you can see a resulting DTM on the bottom circle, um, which we validate with LIDAR from uh, priority aerial uh, laser scanning missions and from ISAT-2 spaceborne LIDAR. We have six and a half million hectares of this published now, and we will hit a 10 million hectare mark this spring when our 2022 acquisition is delivered. After that, we have a growing stock theme, and this is what most of us think of when we hear the term EFI. Um, it's a set of attributes describing volume, basal area, mean diameter, et cetera, at a 20 meter pixel. This is powered by ground plots and then summarized to polygons, which we derive from the land cover and terrain byproducts. We use a two phase uh, system for our ground plots. In the first phase, we use the outputs of the land cover and terrain um, plus PALSAR radar data. So we've got percent softwood, uh, height, canopy cover from our FRI. We bring in the PALSAR, uh, so the Japanese radar satellite data. And then we break our accessible land base into a set of um, 100 to 200 clusters and sample the nearest centroid. Um, so the, the the grid location that's closest to the middle of the centroid. So I've got an arrow, clumsily drawn arrow here from one point on this landscape. There, there's a green dot here every 500 meters, that's our parent grid. And we would select the one, the grid that's close to the center of this green area here um, as a representative sample. So that's our nearest centroid sampling regime. It's a, it is a type of structurally guided sampling. And we find it very efficient uh, when we basically plug and play that data into the procedures outlined um, in sort of <laughs> the seminal publication by our colleagues at CFS to generate our EFI rasters. So there's 400 square meter plots and we build 20 meter pixels of things like gross merchantable volume. Now, uh, many of us are, are familiar with George Box's reminder that all models are wrong and some are useful. Uh, we apply that here like a daily affirmation and each of our inventories goes through a second phase of sampling. So we select a stand in proportion to the total EFI volume estimate within it. And so you can see that here, I've circled a stand that has uh, in yellow, uh, that stand was selected uh, based on a probability proportional to volume sample. Um, and then within that stand, we select a non-null raster pixel, so a pixel with volume, and we put in uh, the exact same phase one plot design, so a 400 square meter plot. Um, once we, we complete that measurement, then we uh, cruise the neighborhood with a grid of 12, a diamond shaped grid of 12 variable radius plots, um, which you can try to show here in a, a tree centric view of the world. Um, and we use this data to compare our inventory performance at both a plot level where we're really familiar with, you know, understanding what that, you know, our RMSE at a plot level looks like, but also at a medium median stand size. And this becomes public information. 
Um, we can use this to pull any bias out of our inventory. And we publish uh, exactly these results on our website so that all users of our inventory can see what it is that they're getting. Um, so I feel like in the past five years, our EFI has gotten to a level of maturity that's beyond development and is fully operational. But it's really only one part of a more integrated system that we call forest inventory. And I know that in many jurisdictions and, and, and ours included, uh, we've had firewalls between our forest inventory and our growth and yield teams, but they are intrinsically linked. And uh, this slide is, is kind of like the map you see on a subway system, except you need to take both lines to get where you're going. And that destination is sustainable wood supply and efficient operations. The green sections uh, show where we have a good handle on on, on the process and the orange sections are a little bit rougher roads. So if we start here on the growth and yield side, we need to deploy a growth model that allows us to project historical plots. So if you, you think back to those previous slides where I showed the clusters, um, you might realize that we actually haven't sampled the land base for yield curve stratification. And do I wanna go back out to the field for a third phase? Not really. Um, so we just, we've sampled, we've sampled to make a map and we've sampled to confirm it's correct. But we'd like to be able to leverage the 10,000 plots we put in in the previous decade for yield curve development. Or maybe like, uh, you know, like Oliver talked about um, leveraging virtual plots essentially um, from our EFI. And we want a bit more precision than the empirical curves of yesterday uh, provided. So this means we need to, um, we need to test some growth models and we're working on that, um, but I'm gonna save that whole story for a, another presentation. Um, so now we've got growth models, we've got some plots, we can stratify them, we can fit yield curves as the forecasting engine in our wood supply model. Uh, eventually we need to check on the realism of our yield curves against another set of monitoring plots. I'm willing to go back to the field for those ones. Um, but let's go back to the EFI line. So I think we've made good progress on getting things like volume and basal area and, and diameter and heights. Um, but we're not at this point able to link to our yield curves and generate an allowable cut because we haven't solved the species mapping problem. And so that's the focus that I'd like to spend the rest of my time talking about today. So those of you who attended uh, this forum last year will have seen this slide, and I presented it as our first foray into testing non-LIDAR-based EFI species predictions to finalize our EFI mapping. We hired seven vendors to produce species prediction rasters. And what I mean by that is the proportion of each species by basal area on a 20 meter cell. And we did this in three different land bases. Leoville here in the top left, which is heavily Aspen dominated, that's shown in a light yellow color. And uh, it's topographically interesting, lots of short, steep slopes, um, but floristically very simple. Um, we also included the Pasqua Hills, which is a, um, a locally significant hill complex, but mostly sort of eastward slopes with some um, some heavily um, dissected drainage, um, but very diverse floristically, lots of different species that are existing here. And then Timber Bay, which is, uh, a, is flat, um, lots of different species and has ha seen a lot, of, uh, a lot of action in the past 20 years. So this is, a, this is a very significant portion of our working forest. So it's heavily utilized. And on the right here, I've just got an example of one of um, the species prediction maps uh, for the Pasqua escarpment. So uh, this slide here shows seven different predictions for the proportion of white spruce in each cell in the Pasqua uh, escarpment area of interest. Uh, on the bottom left here, this is the uh, air photo interpretation uh, from 2002. The remaining ones are uh, 
satellite based EFI style predictions of the proportion of white spruce. And the first thing you can tell is, boy, they are different. Uh, some of them have very little, some of them have quite a bit. Um, and so we needed to do some comparison among them. Um, so let's assume that for this land base, uh, I've drawn this red streak here at 12 and a half percent. And let's assume that that's the correct number um, for the, you know, the, the basal area proportion of white spruce for, for that land base. So in this case, two vendors, the one with the blue arrow at the bottom and the other, or light blue, and the other one with the dark blue arrow, uh, both achieve that 12 and a half percent but they achieve it very differently. So if you follow the light blue arrow or the dark blue arrow, you can see that you know, one of them has white spruce existing in about 30% of the pixels, whereas the other one has it in over 75% of the pixels. So you know, um, the, the light blue arrow is, is a targeted approach, one that might make omission errors, and the other a blanket approach that would be guilty of significant commission perhaps. Uh, so we went to the field to figure out which is, which is true. We designed a sample of 70 plots that closely matched the distribution um, by cover types of our land base. So that these numbers here, 11 through to 99 are, are just sort of a cover type code for us. And we wanted to make sure that our samples matched the area of interest. Um, we kept those samples close to our chest. Uh, none of the vendors have ever seen them or know anything about where they might be. And at each of those plots, we established um, a grid of 16 prison plots spaced 25 meters, um, what we affectionately call the waffle, um, which results in one hectare of an intensely of an intensely cruise mega plot. And at those plots, we uh, tallied at each tree greater than 1.3 meters. So anything over breast height uh, by species um, and we derive species proportions by basal area. Last year, I had done a number of comparisons. I'd looked at the species distribution for each AOI visually, sort of like I showed you with the white spruce earlier. I tested a number of, for the number of correctly called classes at, at a number of level of detail. So, uh, from the uh, you know a species label or a, a string, typical inventory label to uh, what if you get just the just you know of the of the species in there? Can you put the first three in their correct order? Um, roll this up to a provincial forest type. How many different species are present there? What is the leading species? I also looked at them on a continuous scale where I compared the um, predicted and the observed on a one-to-one -one plot and calculated various goodness of fit statistics like bias, root mean square error, and uh, a number of indexes of agreement. And uh, that was fine, but uh, I didn't have enough information to put this in context. And so Pez, as you mentioned at the beginning, it might be my catchphrase, but how good is good enough? Um, what is the benchmark for this work? So we hired two different highly regarded photo interpreters and we asked them to interpret those mega plots directly. So they saw where the plots were that they, they interpreted them um, in a soft copy environment, uh, but we're not allowed to see any of the ground plots, uh, ground plot data. Um, and then we also brought in the legacy, um, the legacy photo interpretation. And so the legacy interpretation is vendor number 10. It's shown in red. The two new soft copy interpreters um, are number 11 and 12. And the remote sensing uh, solutions that we've seen are color coded uh, by vendor uh, from green to yellow to blue. Um, and in this case with the dark green, we had three different approaches by one vendor. So that's, that's sort of the color coding there. When we look at the panel on the left, we see the result for the leading species. The y-axis is the proportion of the correct relative to the ground. Um, for Leoville, the most simple land base, most solutions are pretty, pretty reasonable for getting to leading species. In this case, the legacy inventory is still the best, 
um, as it was supported by intensive field calibration. It was 20 years ago, but we pounded the ground to train our interpreters. Um, two solutions are as good as a fresh interpretation. Uh, and those interpreters worked without that extensive field calibration and five of them are reasonable. When we move to the right and we look at the results for provincial forest type, that pattern really changes. So forest type for us uh, is a combination of getting the relative proportion of hardwood and softwood correct, the first, the leading species, and then the second leading species. So this is really where the rubber hits the road for us. And this is the stratifier for our yield curves. Um, and here you can see that the accuracy as you move from left to right or from leading species to provincial forest type, it, it really drops. Um, and two interpreted solutions, two or sort of the two interpreted solutions and three remote sensing solutions sort of um, I would consider viable. When we move to the more diverse land base at the Pasqua, the remote sensing solutions diverge a bit. On the left, you can see a bit of a, a stratification. Some are better than others um, at the provincial forest type or at the leading species level. But again, as you move to the right and you get to the provincial forest type, there's really only one solution that is on par with photo interpretation. When we move to the most um, diverse yet disturbed site, um, we can see if, if I'm just going to toggle back and forth, so we're going to watch the red bar. So here it's quite high up at 60 and here it drops down to just around 50. So with more disturbance in your land base and more active land base, the value of the legacy interpretation is decreased, but, um, and it doesn't look very impressive here compared to the remote sensing solutions at the leading species level. But if you're trying to get provincial forest type, that legacy inventory still has a lot of value. And so when we put this all together, um, so the, the graph here on the very left is all three of those AOI smooshed together. And again, I've got the remote sensing solutions in the green to yellow coloring, um, the legacy inventory in red, and the air photo, new fresh and air photo interpretations in uh, gray and black. And so at the leading species level, um, we have four vendors that are at about or st statistically the same as 65%, which I would think is a fair benchmark given the performance of our forest inventory air photo uh, interpretations. So, so what is, how good is good enough? 65 is good enough. And I would say, statistical striking distance of 65 is good enough. So if you get 55, is it, is it fine? It, it might be, it depends on how hard you sample and what the variability is. So I'm using a 65% and, um, and basically within um, an alpha of 0.2 or, or as my criterion for acceptability. When we move to the provincial forest type, I think the benchmark may be more around 50%. And it does depend on what's classified with what. Um, but here we can see there's really only one remote sensing solution that's within striking distance of the target. We're gonna move to a little bit more stringent criteria here and go to a species string. So this is the traditional inventory label. White spruce, six, trembling aspen, three, jack pine, one. In less than one third of the cases, have we gotten that right with any technology? That tells me this is not the metric we want to measure ourselves against. Um, at, so the photo interpretation uh, had the best approach or sort of the highest accuracy when we got to species string, but I would say at less than a third of the time being right, it's maybe not the, the yardstick by which we want to measure ourselves. And if we move the furthest step to the right, we can look at the proportion at which the number of species estimated is correct. 
And so here we see a challenge with some of the remote sensing techniques is that they, they either overestimate or underestimate a little bit um, by the number on the number of species, whereas the photo interpreters seem to be able to pick this up pretty well. If we take this to more um, quantitative terms and we look at the precision of our prediction as measured by the root mean square error. And so we want to have on, on the left side, we want to have uh, the bars as low as possible. And I've just taken the best fitting remote sensing solution here and I've compared it to the uh, photo, old legacy photo interpretation in the middle and the new, the best of the new photo interpretations on the right hand side. So remote sensing has got the little satellite over the tree, the legacy in inventory has got the pocket stereoscope, the new, the best of the new ones got this anaglyph image, which reminds me of a soft copy setup. The colors here represent the species. And so what we can see here is that the root mean square error for most species with the uh, remote sensing inventory is lower than with the photo interpretation. The precision, the bias is lower. So we're getting better results uh, for the remote sensing solution at that level. Now that I've got a little arrow here showing this green line, um, that's the line for balsam fir. And so unlike say Newfoundland where balsam fir is a very prominent species in Saskatchewan, balsam fir is certainly present, but it's rare. And so we didn't have enough balsam fir probably in any of the remote sensing training data um, to get an to get really good predictions. Um, whereas the, the well-trained interpreter can sort of infer its presence. And so their error in balsam fir is much lower than ours um, through the remote sensing. When we move to the left, this is the uh, measure index of agreement. And so now the, what I wanna have is a number as close to one as possible. And what we can see here is again, the index of agreement or the overall quality of the inventory um, is pretty similar among air photo interpretation, be it pocket stereoscopes, heads down on desk, soft copy, or the remote sensing with the exception of these rare species that were perhaps not sampled enough to provide training in the remote sensing. So the takeaway from this slide for me is that the best remote sensing for all but that rare species is comparable, um, but we know it was done with much greater speed and much lower cost. So what are the rest of my takeaways? What have I learned in the past year or so? We're a bit over time, Elaine. So if you can do the takeaways quickly, that'd be great. Thanks. Sure. Um, so you need to really look at your old inventory. It is your goalpost. There is a range of quality commercial offerings out there. Um, if you only need the leading species in the boreal, you're probably likely to have success. But if you need more of a type stratification, do a pilot study. Let's agree never to use species strings ever again for assessing. And there's lasting value in your old interpretation, even if it's at a scale that's 50 times larger than your EFI pixel. And the, I guess my, my ask is let's all work on how we can work to incorporate those data, reuse those data in our EFI. And that's it for me. Thank you for your time. Those are some wise words, Lane. Thank you. Um, I'll um, just uh, send people over to break so that we have time to stretch our legs and everything. But in the meanwhile, people who want to field some questions to Lane, you can, you're welcome to type them into the chat or directly to him. And uh, um, if you want to answer those questions, Lane, you're welcome to do so. Um, and then we can reconvene for the afternoon break at... Uh, 25 after the hour, depending on where you are in the country, uh, that would be great. So uh, let's take a you know, six minute break, a little shorter than intended, but I think this is valuable information to share. So it was well worth it. Uh, so thank you, Lane. And uh, yeah, so there's a few <laughs> questions right away there if you want to, me to read them for you.
Yeah, so did the vendors uh, share any detail of their workflows with you? I don't imagine they would have revealed much detail, but I'm wondering if you have a sense of which approaches work best among the remote sensing solutions for leading species in forest type classification. I don't have much information on uh, on how that was done. I I do know uh, which vendors tried to incorporate um, you know, I sort of, I have a good idea of which vendors use what input data, but not much about the process that they use from, from input data to product. Okay. And then uh, uh, Pierre uh, says, uh, Lane, is your remote sensing solution based on Sentinel imagery? I, I believe that Sentinel imagery is used. Um, I, I know it's used by multiple of them, and I believe the one that is the most promising does use it. All right. Well, thanks for those questions, and thank you very much, uh, Lane. It's always super insightful to see your validation approach to everything. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, okay, so we can uh, reconvene in five minutes now. Uh, thank you. Take care.
Oh, hello everyone. Hopefully everyone made it back from a quick break and was able to stretch their legs. I um, wonder if Chris is with us. Chris from BC, who's our next speaker? <laughs> well, I guess we'll extend the break a little, a couple minutes longer. Aha, there he is. <laughs> okay sorry about that oh no that's uh, fine that's fine uh, just, i just had to make a tea for myself so oh that's perfect going together here uh, trying to keep it as a fun of an atmosphere okay perfect i see your screen and all right <clears throat> Great. So I'll see how this goes. My bandwidth is terrible here, so I might have to cut my video. But um, I guess if anyone finds that terrible as well, they can put it in the chat and I will uh, cut the video. So uh, thanks for having me today, Pez and everyone else. Um, I'm going to do a kind of a strategic snapshot of where we're at uh, with operational enhancements to the BC forest inventory using airborne LIDAR. So my presentation outline today, uh, I'm going to talk a bit about... Uh, I'm sorry, Chris, uh, but your your, uh, your slides are not showing up in presentation mode, so I think you might have to cut off your video so that your slides get priority. Okay. Uh, uh, it's still not catching up. What if... Um... Are you still on my, pre my titles? Yeah. yeah, we can just see your kind of a PowerPoint. You're not in presentation mode sort of thing. So it might have not caught up to when you clicked on presentation mode. Uh oh, <laughs> this isn't good. <laughs> uh, does Sharon have a copy of your presentation? She does, yeah. Yeah, uh, Sharon, are you there? And could you maybe share your screen and, and uh, as a yeah, I can Chris do presents. that. Perfect. Yeah. Just give me one second. That's why we have a backup. <laughs> so I'll stop sharing then. Yeah. But then you could probably turn your video back on. I don't know if it works. Yeah, yeah, you'll be speaking. So you'll be the one who we can see while. Well. Okay, great. You'll just have to uh, give a cue to Sharon to switch your slides when when it's time. All right. Well, I apologize for that. So hopefully we can get this rolling. Yeah. Okay, perfect. We're in presentation mode. Great. All right. Perfect. So yeah, uh, like I said, I'm just going to give a quick strategic kind of snapshot of where we're at with the operational enhancements to the BC Forest Inventory. Um, this is kind of just the work that we're doing within the ministry. There's a whole bunch of other researchers and licensees and operational people working on other projects as well. So uh, this is just a snapshot of mainly what we're doing and how I'll, I'll touch on what, what a few other people are doing. So uh, next slide, please, Sharon. So this is the presentation outline for today. Uh, going to talk a bit about this new um, forest inventory we're, we're developing across the province. It's called a predictive forest inventory. Uh, and I'll just uh, give you a summary of that. Uh, number two here is we're using um, airborne LiDAR scanning to improve the photo estimation process. And that kind of involves uh, making more detailed terrain models and coming up with LiDAR tree uh, heights as samples for the input into the photo estimation. Uh, number three here is provincial forest tracking, uh, harvest tracking, excuse me. Uh, so I'll touch on that, on some developments that we're working on there, and I'll touch on just a few other projects that we're uh, also involved in. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so the predictive forest inventory, it's a, it's a next generation LIDAR-based forest inventory uh, in BC, and it's mainly designed for timber supply areas across the province. And we apply it in two phases. So um, phase one is a regression-based inventory attribute prediction uh, based on fixed radius ground samples used for calibration. And this is um, essentially an area-based approach to get at uh, basal area per hectare, 
quad quadratic mean diameters, uh, stems per hectare, and uh, heights. And phase two of the predictive forest inventory is an imputation-based uh, prediction designed using many high-resolution stereo photo samples. So we try to capture about 2% of the project land base, and we get uh, full BRI uh, type photo interpretations for all of those samples. And so we use those samples to train a random forest uh, prediction to get at leading species. And um, for age, we use a, um, it's a nonlinear regression using some existing uh, data sets from our, our current inventory. Uh, and these are on the map here, uh, two areas um, in the south, uh, boundary timber suppliers, it's about 700,000 hectares. And we're just wrapping up that project. It's been a four year project. And um, in the interior, uh, interior Douglas fir zone in the center of the province, um, we started that pro project last year, and that's about 910,000 hectares. Um, so those two are active right now. And uh, next year, we're going to follow up and start uh, in the Invermere timber supply area, which is about 1.3 million hectares. So we're slowly. Um, expanding this into larger, larger timber supply areas across the province. So that's a good thing. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so just an update on this project. It's, uh, it's been a four year project. So a lot of development and a lot of time has gone into this. Um, we completed an audit sample um, to evaluate this final product. Uh, it, that was completed in the fall of uh, last year, 2022. And we have one more uh, audit program planned for the spring of 2023. And that's going to focus on the polygon level um, accuracy assessment. So uh, we'll, in the audit samples from 2022, were single point uh, fixed radius plots. And so um, we have uh, audits for those, and uh, subsequently we'll be looking at the polygon polygons um, in in this spring. So um, internally, we're using this data for timber supply review. Um, analysts are incorporating into the into their workflows, um, and the the growth and yield um, section of our branch are obviously using this data to um, generate new yield curves for for this area. Um, so initial testing for growing and projecting these volumes is ongoing, and we're also testing uh, this integration into the provincial inventory system. So next slide, please. Uh, the second project that we started last year is in the Caribou uh, area of the province, interior Douglas fir zone. It's about 910,000 hectares spanning 100 mile house in Williams Lake. And so we've completed all the LIDAR processing for this area, including all the terrain canopy derivatives and 20 meter metrics. And uh, we have compiled, we've sampled and compiled all of the calibration data for the um, phase one of this project. And we're using about 185 fixed radius plots to do that. The addition in this project is where, um, as we've seen in other provinces, they have a, a larger 11.28 fixed radius plot to do this calibration work. Uh, but in addition to that, our ground samplers always collect a small tree plot, which is um, in the center of the 11.28 and it's 5.64 meters. So uh, in previous projects, we've never considered using that small tree plot data for anything. Uh, but um, as an enhancement to this project, we're gonna try to include that and come up with um, uh, sapling kind of small tree models um, independent of the, the, the kind of mature, mature timber. So uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the second piece here is um, we obviously are still doing the photo estimated uh, vegetation resource inventory across the province in certain areas. Uh, this is mainly due to lack of LIDAR coverage. Uh, in the most cases, um, a lot of our LIDAR coverage to date is piecemeal. As you can see in this graphic here, we have the two timber supply areas where we're, we're working on this 
um, to try to use LIDAR to improve the VRI photo estimation. And we're doing this in kind of two, two phases. The first is to um, create higher resolution digital terrain models uh, for the soft copy. Um, estimation. And the second is to provide the photo interpreter with individual tree LIDAR samples across a grid and it's kind of spanning all of the polygons. So they have um, a good idea of what the tree heights are in those polygons prior to the attribution. Uh, and so we're applying these in two, two areas of the province right now in the graphic, uh, the Fraser timber supply area, uh, just outside of Vancouver and the Sunshine Coast. Uh, yeah, so next slide, please. Uh, so this first one is we're trying to improve the terrain surfaces. So we're coming up with a, um, a five meter terrain model for the entire timber supply area. And we're using the LIDAR to do that. And the voids are interpolated using some ancillary data uh, we have province-wide trim uh, terrain models that are photo-based from the 1990s. So we're using those, uh, which are 25 meters. And we're also exploring the use of some alternative data. So uh, we got Sky Forest to run some five meter terrain models for us uh, for this purpose. And so this aids in the photo interpretation. Uh, we provide stereo terrain following to do the delineations. And uh, we get some height from ground measurements to aid in the uh, attribution of these stands. So this graphic just shows some of the an elevation profile using these three data sets. So the uh, red is the, the, the LIDAR uh, terrain model. The blue is the current trim that's available across the province. And the green transect is from the Sky Forest uh, product. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, for the second piece of this aiding photo interpretation, we're providing the photo interpreters with a uh, sample of LIDAR trees. And so this is sampled on a 100 meter grid and we use a circular radius neighborhood. Uh, we provide them with height quartiles of the individual trees. And so this uh, provides the interpreter with a, a local height sample that they can use to actually calibrate or directly attribute uh, each of the polygons that they're that they're looking at. So um, we're just trying to test this and see how it works for the photo interpretation process to, um, to develop a, a, a more accurate vegetation resources inventory. Uh, next slide, please. So number three here, provincial harvest tracking. So typically um, since 2005, this has been a branch uh, forest analysis and inventory branch led project updating annually uh, with the inventory projection. So we do that every year, once a year, we will grow our inventory, we will um, cut out the cut blocks based on um, the licensees result submissions, and also this satellite derived Landsat change detection. So we do that annually. Um, unfortunately, the results submissions from the licensees can be one to two years out of date. And on top of that, our Landsat change detection can also be upwards of a year out of date. So um, that's a bit problematic when we're trying to determine what was cut uh, more recently or uh, kind of getting an up-to-date um, picture of where we're at in terms of forest inventory. Next slide, please. So there has been an uptick in demand to increase the temporal frequency of harvest tracking not only to support forest inventory, but also provide more current data for uh, such things as timber supply review, compliance and enforcement, timber pricing, and the new one, monitoring in old growth forests. So this example on the bottom just shows kind of a higher temporal frequency that we're seeing that we can actually track this polygon um, you know, monthly rather than annually. So we're, we're trying to use um, some of the best data sets to, to do this work. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, so we couldn't rely on annual mapping. You know, if the minister comes to us and says, we need to find out what was cut in the month of June. Uh, previous to this year, we couldn't um, tell them anything about that. So, um, but now we have a few tools developed in place to actually answer those questions. And so we need to consider both uh, to track vegetation uh, in the summer, and we do that with NDVI, and snow cover in the winter, uh, because clear cuts have a strong snow, single, snow signal in the winter time. So as you can see here, we can track these polygons um, pretty much monthly, uh, or even um, with greater temporal frequency than we've ever had in the past. So um, uh, next slide, please. And so this is just a close up of how we're doing this. Um, so it's usually on a permit basis, but we're trying to apply this at the provincial level. So this is a cutting permit um, example, and you can see uh, 2020, October 19th, it was um, fully green. Um, and then November 2021, it was still fully green. Um, and then we had uh, three quarters of the polygon cut uh, between November 1st, uh, 2021 and January 20th, 2022. And these um, data are every Sentinel image that we had to throw at at this analysis. So we started from January 2020 uh, and we plotted the uh, the normalized difference vegetation index and a normalized difference snow index. And so the vegetation index is in green, uh, the snow index is in red. And so you can track these indices through time. And once the snow index um, overtops the, veg the vegetation index, then we have a candidate that's actually been cut. So we applied this methodology to a bunch of permits around the province and it seems to be working pretty well. So we're gonna continue with this work, um, but this is kind of just kind of fresh off the press on how we're trying to improve the temporal frequency of our harvest tracking. Next slide, please. Uh, other projects we're working on. <clears throat> Uh, the BC Woodlot LiDAR Forest Inventories, uh, we have ongoing enhanced forest inventory projects in three woodlots on the coast. And these woodlots are typically about 400 to 800 hectares. So they're very uh, small area generally, but uh, they require operational forest inventory. So it's a really good fit for uh, some of these enhanced forest inventory projects. Uh, Currently, the BC government has submitted um, a Treasury Board proposal to fund province-wide LIDAR acquisition. So this would be a five-year project, um, and we would try to, over those five years, uh, fly the entire province with airborne LIDAR. So I hope that goes ahead. We've submitted three in the past, and they've all failed. So I hope this one uh, gets some traction and goes forward. Uh, LIDAR individual tree inventories and tree farm licenses. This is a uh, licensee led work ongoing in a uh, few timber, timber far tree farm licenses in the province to support enhanced forest inventory, timber supply review, and old growth management. And the last one I have here is a predictive ecosystem mapping. So um, this is just started up over the last year. We're covering approximately 5.7 million hectares across the province. Uh, and next slide, please. I can give you a brief update on this. So the, the goal is to develop a cost-effective, spatially explicit and accurate uh, method to um, produce these predictive ecosystem maps across the province. And so we're testing this in about 5.7 million hectares uh, over a lot of the LIDAR coverages that currently exist. Um, and the contact is uh, Jen. So you can reach out to her if you have any questions about the PEM, the PEM mapping across British Columbia. And uh, that's all I got for today. Are there any questions? Oh, thank you, Chris. I, it's always a lot to follow. <laughs> There's so many projects going on yeah, in BC. Definitely. It's great. It's great. Yeah. Thank you for that overview. Uh, it's, it's really insightful. No um, yeah. Are there any questions uh, for Chris? Uh, you can put them in the chat. Um, I mean, one of the, the 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 questions I had for you is with all these projects going on on a kind of timber area basis, uh, are there any plans on on 
are all these projects um, being connected somehow, you know, in, 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 in uh, or overlapping? Uh, not really, no. <laughs> well, the, with the predictive for uh, ecosystem mapping, we're trying to integrate those into something like a, uh, the, the forest inventories that we're producing as well. So there is some synergies there. Um, okay. But a lot of them, yeah, are kind of separate at the moment, kind of going off in different directions. Um, but I assume they will kind of converge at some point, yes. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely different priorities in different locations, I understand that, and it's such a big province uh, that's, you know, so diverse. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, since we're a bit over time uh, delayed, so maybe we'll, uh, you know, if you have any questions, you can send them directly to Chris or put them in the chat, but we'll probably move on to the next speaker. So thank you so much, Chris, again. Great, thank you. And our next speaker will be oh uh, speaker will be Brandon, giving us the first EFI update from the Yukon. All right, can you guys hear me? Okay, I can hear you loud and clear. All right, let me uh, try sharing my screen. Perfect. We can see your screen. How are we looking? You're in presentation mode. It's all yours. All right. Um, yeah. Thanks everyone for uh, all of the useful information. I'm definitely learning a lot today. Um, and yeah, so I wanted to start off uh, just with a quick review of kind of where we're at, um, some challenges we have, what we're planning on doing. And then I'm actually going to pose maybe some questions and looking for some help. Um, in some methodologies for rapidly assessing uh, post-fire and post-disturbance areas for salvage harvesting. So, so this last year, uh, we've really been focusing on what we have available to us and using that. Uh, we have RGB data, we have uh, UAVs that we can use. So uh, collecting UAV data um, and using that to do analysis like roads, slopes, um, that sort of thing at the cut block scale. Uh, we don't have anything wider than that at the, the moment. Um, we also started working on a government-wide LIDAR procurement process. Um, it's quite a big process as we're, we're just starting this, um, but hoping to get it up and running by next spring, which is coming up quick. Uh, but that'll be follow following the minimum um, specifications and the Federal Airborne LIDAR Data Acquisition Guideline. Uh, but one key thing we wanted to include in there was the ability to adjust specifications based on the different project specific needs. Um, we didn't want to have just one, one type of LIDAR or one quality of LIDAR flown across all these areas. We wanted to be able to adjust it. Um, so that's, that's kind of what we're going with. Uh, we we're also working with the available LIDAR data we have uh, and the plot data that we have and trying to do something uh, fairly cheap, but we called it a budget individual tree inventory uh, at the cut block scale. So we used um, RGB uh, data from our UAVs to build canopy height models. Um, and then we applied tree metrics from timber cruising data and LIDAR uh, that we have in sporadic areas uh, to these canopy height models. The vision is to develop localized models so we can do this with easier, uh, but we really need to do that accuracy, accuracy assessment, which I know other people have mentioned and started doing, uh, but we need to do that up here as well. So, like I said, our current situation, um, we're predominantly post disturbance salvage harvesting uh, of wildfires, and there was a big uh, spruce bark beetle outbreak a number of years ago. Um, and trying to salvage harvest there, but we really need to increase our planned wood supply areas. But one of our challenges are resources. Um, LIDAR is sporadic and outdated. The red on the map on the right hand side is the extent of our LIDAR across the whole territory, uh, basically following highways and communities. And our ground plots are also very sporadic. Um, the fires impact our previous inventory information, which is uh, fairly sporadic as well. Um, it, we have it, but uh, it's older. And then satellite imagery is poor 
and not in the date ranges we often need uh, when we're trying to salvage fires, which are pretty recent. So um, the budget individual tree inventory that you saw before on that previous slide is included in this area on the right hand side. Uh, you can see kind of the blue lines there where we took the canopy height model uh, and applied those, those numbers to it. Um, so our plans this year coming up uh, are to procure LIDAR for the area, um, depending on how our LIDAR procurement process goes. Uh, and doing that, we want to do an accuracy assessment on that RGB data that we have um, and assess the previous log areas for further potential. So now moving kind of into that uh, challenge area that I discussed, uh, I wanted to focus on one individual area that we're looking at. Uh, it's called the Poison Lake Burn. It's about 33,000 hectares. Currently, we have no data. Uh, I believe this is a sentinel imagery. Uh, we, there's no access in there. Um, it burned in 2019. And we're, we're really hoping to get inventory information this summer uh, so we can guide timber harvest planning. They want to start winter 2023. So we're on a very tight deadline. Um, one of the reasons is often you get low down in these areas, you start losing the timber that's standing and then it becomes more difficult to harvest things like that. Um, so that's why we're really pushing this. And just to give you an idea of what it currently looks like, uh, you can see this is some imagery that was actually taken last week, I believe, um, of the area. And so this is the kind of stand we're looking at when looking from above. Uh, and, and one of the things that stands out to me is there's not much canopy to work with. Um, when we're comparing it to something like this, that's, that's a lot more to work with um, when especially using RGB data so, and developing point clouds. So our planned approach um, is to develop a small THP area 3,000 hectares or so, and kind of have it as a pilot project. Uh, and we'll try and get this done by 2023, early 2023 winter. Uh, so we're gonna try collecting multispectral imagery with UAVs that we have, um, and then procure LIDAR depending on how that goes, and determine some rapid assessment methods for the post-fire salvage harvesting uh, in the Yukon. And then what we learn from that process, we'll hopefully be able to scale up to the larger THP area, which is 30,000 hectares, um, hopefully beginning in 2024 harvesting. And, and we'll really, yeah, take what we learned in the small one and apply it to the bigger one. So in saying all that, um, my questions, uh, how do other folks perform rapid assessment of post-disturbance areas uh, for salvage harvest? And has anyone done it? Is it successful? Is it a challenge? Um, are there resources that I don't know about? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm open to, to hearing what others have to say. Thank Thank you, Brandon. And thank you for throwing the gauntlet back to our audience here. Uh, so we have we have about 10 minutes or so to, um, to, to try to help out Brandon. If you have any suggestions or questions for him, that would help guide him in, 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 in Yukon in their, their plans for, uh, I guess, yeah, rapid uh, disturbance detection and, and salvage harvesting. Uh, it's a very unique uh, situation you're in. It's, uh, it's really interesting to see. <laughs> Oh, there we go. We have Ian, who's just mentioned that uh, he mapped uh, uh, 300,000 uh, square uh, cubic meters of blowdown using a helicopter. So I don't know if you have access to helicopter uh, helicopters up there with your, your sensors, because right now your hyperspectral sensor is mounted on your UAV. Um, yeah, we're going to be doing that from a UAV. But like I said, we're doing that uh, light uh, procurement process. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to get helicopter LIDAR if we need it. Um, and that's, I, I guess my question is, uh, without the canopy, uh, the traditional method's gonna work of uh, analyzing the LIDAR data. Um, mm -hmm. Are we gonna be able to get things like volumes very easily out of it? Yeah, uh, so don't have an answer to that one yet, but someone, uh, Sasha says, uh, hello, do you have a satellite multi-spectrum burn severity product? No. 
Not that I know of. I mean, I, I mean there might be someone out there that does. Um, currently, we don't. Okay. So I'm guessing that means that that exists. <laughs> uh, the other Ian is saying just uh, use georeferenced photos. Just use georeferenced photos. So if you have aerial photos uh, or yeah. even UAV photos, that might be a good way to you know map out your burns and um, potentially quantify. Yeah. I, I think like we have them mapped out. It's it's really getting that those metrics that we want out of it, like timber volume and um, yeah, where the, the good sources of timber are in that area. Uh, so we can plan roads and things like that. Um, yeah. Um, Joel says, uh, we use SkySat custom tasking satellite imagery. So that might be something to look into. Okay. And then Sasha says, we can help. So there we go. Okay. You have a contact now, someone who can help. All right. um, so I feel like people are, are are encouraged. It seems like no one's saying that it's not possible to quantify volumes from <laughs> burnt trees that are standing up like uh, chopsticks. Um, yeah. As long as they don't become pickup sticks, I, I guess is what you're hoping for. Yeah, and that's that's our challenge, just getting there before before that happens. Um, yeah. I wonder if uh, some of that uh, harvesting um, tools from BC, uh, that rapid detection of harvesting could also be used for rapid detection of, of, of fires uh, with that, that differences after burn. Uh, we have here um, Kathleen saying, we did a burn volume assessment five years ago using drone LIDAR. I'll send you the report. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Kathleen. Yeah, especially if your drone has a capacity to mount a LIDAR on it, then it might be able to rapidly assess, you know, reasonably sized areas. So probably good for your targeted approach. Mm -hmm. yeah, and we've looked at drone LIDAR as well within our procurement process. So if, uh, yeah, if you've got a good assessment and methodology, then I'd love to see it. Yeah, yeah I know from past conversations, uh, being able to fly below cloud cover is sometimes a real benefit for a rapid acquisition of, of uh, aerial imagery. Yeah. Okay, Kathleen says that she will send you that, that report. Yeah, awesome. And if anyone else has uh, any other thoughts, um, please contact me or email me. And uh, yeah, I'd love to chat. Okay. Well, since the Comments are slowing down. I want to, yeah, uh, thanks Brandon again for for breaking the ice on the Yukon front for the EFI. Uh, it's it's really good to see that that things are happening and that you're trying to put put these some of these technologies to use, uh, and your unique uh, unique yeah for unique challenges that you're facing up there. Um, so thanks thanks again, and uh, please feel free to reach out to Brandon if you have any suggestions uh, that can help him on a. a, a with his, his, uh, his um, EFI needs. Um, so now coming up, our next speaker will, or speakers will be Nicolas and Jean-Martin uh, about using harvester head data uh, to model, model force inventory, inventories. Uh, so Jean-Martin, I don't know if you're gonna be- yeah, I'll be I'll be sharing the presentation. Okay, perfect. So unfortunately, you might not be able to see Jean-Martin's face uh, while he's talking. Uh, I'll take oh over yeah, at some point. I think it flips to whoever's speaking. So okay, that's good. Yeah. Um, oh no, I have to first share the screen. Sorry, <laughs> went over that. Uh. <laughs> that's all good. We're back on time. I'm back on track. That's good. Oh well, while well, Nicholas is putting the on the slide uh, in. Uh, first, thank you to uh, to Ostas. Um, yeah, coming. There we go. Oh, there you go. You're Excellent. Good to go. Okay. <clears throat> so let's start this. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Um, probably you know that in, in Eastern Canada, like uh, cut length systems, short wood systems, is becoming becoming the norm. Uh, so, and these machines are incredible in terms of, of data acquisition. Uh, each single tree is measured 
every 10 centimeters for its di diameter. So we have full stem profiles, full stem analysis for each tree that is harvested by these machines. Um, and if you look at the data that is collected, you've got the species, you've got DBH, the stem profile, as I said, you have the merchandise length for, the, for at the tree scale. And then you can have a breakdown of the, the attributes at the for each log. So the size, length, diameter, the volume, the species, the log grade, you've got the machine location and time stamp. So for dendro dendrometrists, that's an incredible sampling machine. And uh, the, when you look at the uh, the amount of information that is collected, we made a quick, a quick calculation that within a year, um, 60 machines is collecting a, the equivalent of 33,000 plots. Uh, to compare the uh, EFI from New Brunswick was calibrated with about 2,500 to 3,000 2, 2, plots. So the amount of data is very interesting. Um, but of course, it is biased in a way that is uh, it is strictly into harvested stands. So it's not a, a uniform sampling of all of all the all the forest. Next slide, please. But in order to tap in this information, uh, right now, in most cases in Canada, uh, with, with some ex exceptions, the data is not used. But to get there, you need a, a system connecting different, different, uh, different, uh, different uh, items. So the first thing, the first thing you need a well calibrated, well maintained sensors on, on your harvest head. So that's the first thing. Um, you need an onboard computer and software for data collection. It provides also performance dashboards, maps, automatic bucking. So you got here in green some examples. And this is uh, oriented toward the operator, informing the operator. Next slide. Next. Um, if you can't uh, put a communication system, either cellular, cellular satellite, satellite is becoming uh, the next step right now with the uh, Starlink system that's becoming a very interesting, very interesting, but also you can use USB keys or smartphone smartphone apps for data muling. Then uh, next slide, uh, the data can be stored into uh, data warehouses. Uh, so uh, some companies are providing the system. Interpine sticks in in uh, in Australia, New Zealand. Also, Biometria is a system existing in Sweden. So uh, and then. Uh, this information can be used by entrepreneur manufacturers or force managers to provide uh, insight about what's going, but also for us to make some forecasts. And finally, a very inter important part is we need business models and standards to make all these things work. And the best strength we've got here is a stand for the standard that is used in, 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 uh, in uh, harvester machines for the harvested data uh, that, is, that is created. So using this, uh, the, the question, research question we have, is can we predict the volume of log per grade, saw log stud would and pop on a cut block based on the data from previous harvests, the site and stand attributes, and the harvest and bucking prescriptions. So in, at the difference of, I would say, more standard traditional force inventory, we're not interested in the standing stock. We're instead interested in the harvest stock in, in, in sorts. And that's a very key information for the for the, uh, the 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 management of the operations of the supply chain. So uh, I'll I'll give the, the mic to uh, my colleague uh, Nicolas. Yes, thank you. Um, so for this proof of concept here, what we're trying to do is develop predictive model on volumes of logs or certain logs characteristics that are based on our Vister data solely and then predicted from a suit of uh, easily available geospatial predictor, ancillary predictors, or whatever source of data we can get our hands on that doesn't require to go on the field. Um, the data we are using uh, came from a private company. Uh, we got data from 30 different contractors working for this company. All the data is from clear cuts in New Brunswick, or actually there was more than clear cuts, but we've subset it to only works on clear cuts uh, for this step of the project. Um, all the data was collected over about a year uh, by over 25 machines. So it represents 
over 1800s uh, combination of day machines. Um, in the clear cut part of the data sets, the one that we, we've been working with, uh, there was about 1600 hectares of forest that was harvested, uh, separated in about 100 different uh, cod blocks or oper operational units. So the average size of these operational units was about 20 hectares. All of this data was uploaded online to a stick system. And so we obtained the data, uh, we downloaded it from the stick system. Uh, and as Jean-Martin mentioned, the standard form, the Stanford D format was the data standard uh, that we that they were working with. Um, so the data we obtain is in tabular format. Uh, we have two different streams of processing. So we work with the tabular data itself. It's a, a description. Each row in the data set is the description of a log. Uh, and then in parallel, each of these logs are associated with coordinates. So we also have a, a geodata processing stream. And um, We've built a semi-automated process in R that does both the tabular data processing and the geospatial data processing. They're done in parallel and then merge at the end together to feed a machine learning algorithm. Um, so in the tabular data processing aspect, uh, there's a few, uh, few observations that need to be clean. So we want to work with uh, uh, actual merchantable products, so we get rid of products that are too small or too thin, or products that are uh, not labeled properly in terms of coordinates. Because with this project here, we need um, we need products that are labeled uh, correctly on the field. Then we need to homogenize the product codes uh, that are associated with these, because all of the data come from from thirty over 30 different contractors. Um, there are discrepancy between contractors in how they would label certain products. And so, so far, this part of the process is done by a human that creates a dictionary. Uh, we think that as we get more and more data, this part of the process could be done by a AI probably. Then we classify the product. Uh, the product classification is done on the basis of uh, products uh, specification for uh, sawwood, studwood, pulpwood. Uh, so based on the product characteristic in terms of length and small in diameters, but also based on the, um, the call by the operators for things like uh, pulpwood, uh, that can be associated uh, not only to product dimension, but also product quality. And so in parallel, we do a geoprocessing of the uh, location of the product. So uh, we have coordinated uh, associated with each of these products. They are not actually the coordinate of the harvester ed itself. It's the, uh, the GPS coordinate of the harvester cabin. So because of this reason, also because of the uncertainties around the GPS coordinate, we have to work at a fairly coarse spatial resolution. A recent article uh, studying the same type of problem here found that uh, there's no bias that's caused by using the harvester location rather than the harvester ed position, as long as your sampling size is over uh, 760 square meter. So we work at a maximum one hectare scale. So what we do is we take the coordinate of each product, we apply a 10 meter buffer that represents the potential extension of the harvester arm, and we unite these buffer to find a probable harvested area. We clip this area with the actual delineation of the um, uh, operational unit or the cut blocks, and then we apply a one hectare grid scale to, uh, to this area. And you end up with cell that are varying in size, maximum size of one hectare. And we only analyze the cells that are over this 760 square meter threshold. So very small cell like this or this uh, would not be evaluated. But then you can label each of the product in the database with a specific grid cell and uh, aggregate these product to get uh, metrics in terms of total volume, um, stem density, 
uh, piece size, so the mean volume per stem or the standard deviation on that matrix. And um, so far, we haven't been able to work in terms of productivity, but uh, we are working on this aspect also. And we think that in the near future, we'll also uh, be able to give metrics on uh, productivity, so in terms of production per time. So to these grid cells, where we now have a uh, product breakdown by categories, uh, we add geospatial predictors. I'm going to go into detail into what predictors we are using, and we train the machine learning models. Uh, we use different types of models, but the end, uh, in the end, what we want to do is use these same predictors that we've applied to our grid cell and use this model to uh, make predictions on new areas. In terms of predictors, we use a whole suit of different types of predictors. Um, so we have that as in forest species composition. Uh, this is an in-house product that's very similar to the North, uh, New Brunswick Forest Inventory. Uh, so they separate species proportion by two layers, and it's a mix of uh, photo interpretation and field validation. Uh, this product is at the 20 meter scale. Uh, we then have spectral satellite image. We get them from the Earth engine. Uh, we get the data from Sentinel-2 because of the spatial resolution of the product. So we get raw data from eight different bands, and then we also calculate uh, uh, data for six different index. And what we input in the model is the mean value for each of these band and index for the month of January, uh, May, July, and October. We also run a seasonal decomposition on the signal of each of these band and index, and we extract the amplitude of the seasonal component. Then we also add climate data to our models. We also get them from the Earth Engine. We use the, the met v 4 database, and we calculate the climate normal um, over the last 30 years. Uh, yeah. For different variables, uh, this is a non-exhaustive list here, mean temperature, precipitation, degree days, uh, and coming radiation, and the same metrics, but for the growing season only. We also use the New Brunswick LiDAR point cloud. So this is the wall-to-wall -wall acquisition that was done between 2014 and 2018. Although this data set is getting a bit old, we found that it's still very useful for our predictions. And we extract a whole the whole suite of uh, statistics on the point distribution in each of our predicting grid cells. We use we use feature map in terms of hydro hydrological model and soil classification, and then finally we also use the uh, company operation plan, so the polygons or the cut blocks of the company uh, that allows us to identify the clear cut areas in the data set. Um, have a more precise delineation of the harvest area, also obtain information on harvest pres prescription and silviculture treatment history. Then for the modeling aspect, we are working with product of different spatial resolution, so one hectare resolution for our harvester data, but then the predictors, uh, some of them are as fine scale as 400 uh, square meter, and some other are very coarse, like climate data. Uh, we get it at the one kilometer uh, square uh, resolution. So that does induce a lot of redundancy in this training data set. Uh, we have to take precautions when we are training our models um, just to avoid the spatial to correlation problem and avoid overfitting our models. Um, so for this reason, we are developing a product currently that can be applied at the cut block scale, although our predictions are done at the 20 meter scale, so the, uh, the resolution of our finest predictor, uh, we advise to use the prediction only at, uh, at the coarser scale, and we find that so far we are very confident about the prediction we can make at the cut block scale, maybe not so much at the finer scale. In terms of model structure, so um, we so far we've been working with common algorithm uh, such as random forest, KNN, and XGBoost, but there's also a separate stream of the project that's looking at more advanced uh, deep learning and complex AI uh, to get uh, refinement on the predictions. We develop a different models for each of the product 
or the predicted features uh, that we're predicting. And uh, of course, each of these uh, each of these model is parameterized and tuned uh, specifically for the for this product. In terms of model validation, um, we work with the cross validation. Um, as I said, based on the operational cut blocks. So we will train the model with a certain amount of cut blocks and validate, validate it with cut blocks that the model hasn't seen yet. Um, we've been also comparing the result we get with the best predictive models that's currently available in term, well, best predictive model that can give information on product breakdowns and uh, specific forest products such as uh, solids, studwood, and uh, pulpwood. Uh, this models that we've compared to it is based on most similar, uh, a tree imputation from uh, most similar neighbor. And then they pass this to a growth model uh, that takes into account the time since the LiDAR data acquisition. And finally, it goes into a bucking models to get an estimates of product breakdown. And so we evaluate the performance of our model then uh, with R squared and RMSCs. I'm going to give an overview of the few preliminary results we have so far. Again, this is using very common algorithm. So some of the results, most of the results you'll see are from random forests. Uh, some are from uh, KNN or XJBoost. Um, so here, the five big plots that you're seeing are the fit in terms of uh, in x-axis, you have how, how much volume was actually measured, and in y-axis is the prediction from the model. Uh, you have the fit statistics in red. Uh, we've hidden the unit of the graph just to preserve uh, data confid confidentiality. The small plots you're seeing here is the fit we get by pixel. So you see it's a lot more noisy, but we get much better fit uh, once we aggregate our prediction at the uh, cut block level. So the big the big plots are at the cut block level. The smaller size are within these cut blocks, uh, the pixel size prediction we get. And we can see that sort of for some product like Sawlog and Studwood, model is performing very good. Uh, the, the error reduction here is the comparison with the other uh, best models available, best model available in the market so far. And we can see that we get reduction in error uh, between 45 and 63 percent, depending on the product. For some other product like pulpwood, um, the performance are maybe not as good. And the reason for this is that pulpwood is the type of product that's not systematically collected uh, or harvested on the field. So there might be operational decision to leave some pulpwood on the ground if it's not needed. And so we just don't measure this data. Uh, with the harvester uh, data set. So like we think for some product there, it's not that we won't ever be able to model them based on harvester data, but there's uh, there's further steps that needs to be taken in terms of modeling. Um, what these models are very good at uh, predicting is the average piece size um, in, a, in a different cut block. And you can see that even at the pixel scale, these predictions are quite good. So um, how much cubic inner on average you can get per stem uh, is always, the regardless of the model we use, is always the predictors that comes as a, with the best fit. One common criticism of um, these machine learning approaches, they can be quite obscure or black box. Um, and sometimes it's hard to understand how you get to the prediction you get. Uh, but we believe that is uh, less and less true. Uh, there's now new methods that are developed to make machine learning model understandable. Uh, here, for example, we started using uh, shapely values, which are derived from um, game theory. And so this provide a very uh, precise and consistent uh, view of the variable importance uh, for certain prediction. And also you can use that to e evaluate the interaction uh, between your variables to get to a certain prediction. So this is an example here for one parameter uh, that we were modeling. 
uh, the saw log volume of spruce fir and jack pine. The vertical order in which you see the parameters is the relative importance of these parameters for the prediction. And you can see here on the x-axis the actual impact of this parameter on the model. So, uh, for example, the stand height as derived from the 95 percentile of the LiDAR point cloud is the most important variable. And you can see that uh, greater values or darker hues are associated with a positive impact on uh, saw log volume. Um, Another important thing to notice is the variety of the data sources that are used by the model. So there's a lot of complex interaction between these variables, and it shows that uh, the sum of all of these data sources is much more informative than any single one uh, taken separately. So with that, I'm going to give uh, give the floor back to Jean Martin who's going to talk about a uh, broader broader aspect of this project and where we're moving uh, in the next steps. Jean Martin, you are muted, so you might want to start again. Thank you. So the uh, being able to forecast the sorts per cut block is a, is a key information for planning uh, that multiple steps. So transportation, optimizing this transportation, that's that's one thing. Uh, secondly, is optimizing the, uh, the the transformation schedules for for uh, for for mills and also the allocation of wood by by mills. Um, so it, it's a starting point for for planning. So uh, that's the important part of it. Um, what are the next steps uh, in that research project? Like Nicolas mentioned, it was a proof of concept. How can we do that? There were some questions about location and precision. Uh, we uh, overcome this problem with uh, with the approach Nicolas presented. So what are the, the so the first the first thing is the forecasting. That's the the, the first line in the in the, in the table is the uh, proof of concept uh, we're working on. Uh, the next step is to improve these predictions with the same data set using advanced machine learning in collaboration with colleagues from UBC and CanNet. Um, and uh, also this data set will be used to, to develop and, 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 and compare uh, even more innovative data uh, uh, AI approaches ensemble learning ensemble learning in polygon generation i won't go into these details but uh, it, it is used to get more points uh, more precision with the same data with more advanced machine learning and um, in in the near future what we want to to tap on is the uh, continuous addition of new data from machines and and, and uh, continuously improve the 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 the, 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 the learner performance uh, using incremental learning method methods, and um, also other more theoretical questions about random effects, and also assessing the precision of harvester yield data uh, using a terrestrial lidar. That's a collaboration with my colleagues from Fiber Center. Uh, next slide, please. So. Um, Key message: Harvester data is a valuable source for forecast harvest yield, and to complement the uh, the current force inventory methods, the data source is largely under under utilized utilized, um, but uh, and it requires a solid system for the collection, creation, and communication of data. Some companies have, has opted uh, as stepped in, in that direction, but we're still uh, lagging in comparison with the Swedes and the Finns. Um, and the ongoing research of the Fiber Center is uh, working on uh, improving the precision, either by changing the, the AI approach or by uh, uh, increasing the, 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 the number of data, or quantity of data in, in the model. That's it. Oh, yeah, I want to acknowledge all the people here. Uh, we were two to speak, but it's a, a, a small crowd working here. So my colleagues from CanMet and Fiber Center, Amir Ben Charad, Mohamed El Fnawi from UBC, Amin Ragab and Mouloud Amazouz, and also the, the group of gentlemen from GDI, GD Irving, 
uh, that we're on with with whom we have a close collaboration for for working the data and trying to to uh, to deploy this solution in, into their uh, their managing planning uh, workflow. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jean-Martin Nicolas. That was really insightful, and and uh, it's it's amazing to see the difference uh, of approaches uh, on this really more operational side of thing of inventories versus what we've been hearing up to now. Um, uh, so, are there any questions from our audience uh, for for Jean-Martin or Nicolas? Uh, please type type them in the in the chat if you do. Um, right off the bat, I thought it was really interesting that you know lidar was was a very important characteristic. Uh, but all the other data sources were pretty much free, uh, and and that's with an even old lidar. And to go back to Lane's point, uh, you you can make good use out of o o old inventory data, even even if it's a you know it, it still has a lot of value to for certain parts of your inventory. Yeah, and it's certainly a part of the project to evaluate the relative value of these subsets of data in terms of uh, how how precise of a prediction we can get, uh, because as you said, some of them are maybe very useful but very costly and maybe a combination of less expensive data can yield similar results at little or no cost exactly so maybe you only do need to um do one lidar acquisition and then supplement it with others okay mm -hmm. here we have a twang as a question there are many variables you use to predict saw log volume that are highly correlated you know those from spectral bands how did you handle this in your model? Um, we do a uh, filtering in terms of um, uh, a predictor uh, that are too correlated. I think uh, we we don't uh, consider predictors that are that have a correlation coefficient over 0.95 at this stage. So uh, we do a basic filtering of the predictor we input in the models. And uh, there is some work being done in terms of uh, refining the, uh, the set of predictors that we use, because so far, for sure, we're just using too many predictors. Uh, uh, so this work is ongoing in terms of predictor selection. Uh, but so far, we've got good results, even if uh, even using these uh, very correlated predictors. Yeah, that's the interesting part of AI. Eh? <laughs> you don't necessarily need to truncate them in some situations. Um, uh, so, no, Sash, just, oops, go ahead, Jonathan. Uh, also, the, yeah, I would say having independent variables is very important for parameter models. When you, want, you want to make some inference from the parameters. That's not the case here. Like here, uh, uh, the literature you've got evidence that even if you've got correlated non-independent variables doesn't affect the precision of the model. You're, you're just, um, of course, if there's too much correlation, you're just wasting your time. Uh, it doesn't supplement information, but uh, it doesn't uh, affect the, the, the quality of the, of the model in comparison with parameters, parametric models. Uh, so Sasha is asking a question of uh, why do you think the climate variables are so important? It seems like a relatively small study area. Yeah, um, no, definitely. It's uh, something I'm wondering myself, like uh, daylight length. Uh, I mean, in the end, it's probably more a surrogate of latitude at this point. We're just looking at New Brunswick. Uh, but it, it's really interesting yeah, to see that uh, some of the climate variables uh, appear to be important. And it's not because the model is able to identify which cut block is where. We're very careful in terms of separating our training data from our validation data, uh, that we don't have uh, cut blocks that are right beside each other that are separated in training and validation. So um, I don't really know how to answer this question other than uh, I'm wondering myself. And correct me if I'm wrong, but we are dealing only with the softwood, right? Uh, yeah, well, we we are making prediction on hardwood, but the, these are the product categories that uh, we can get a really good uh, good fit on, mostly because uh, we don't have a ton of them in the training data set. Uh, so maybe in the future, as we extend this training data set, we might get a better fit on hardwood, but so far, um, our prediction on for hardwood products are horrible. 
Okay. Well, thank you so much. And uh, unless there's another question, while well, we switch uh, presenters, then I'll just uh, thank Jean-Martin and Nicolas for, for their, their talk and, and move on to our, our final speaker, uh, Joanne. You are free to share your presentation and take the floor. All right. With your final words of wisdom for today. Mm -hmm. Can you see me in presentation mode? No, no, we're still not in presentation okay. mode. Take two. Um, rectify that. I know this is going to work. OK, there we go. Oh, perfect. It's all yours. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, everyone, for sticking around to the end. It's always hard to go last. Um, and I've tried to keep this fairly high level. So let's let's get started. So my name is Joanne. I'm a research scientist uh, with the Canadian Forest Service based out of Victoria. And today I want to talk about value added applications of airborne LIDAR for forest management. And what do I mean by value added? Well, these are not necessarily applications that are driving your business case to acquire LIDAR in the first place, but they are examples of applications that are useful for management and that add value to your investment in LIDAR. And so specifically, I want to talk about quantifying forest growth, identifying vertical layers in the canopy, and characterizing riparian areas. Uh, so starting with growth, there are many different ways that we can use LIDAR to inform on forest growth. And as we acquire more and more LIDAR on the land base and we get multiple LIDAR acquisitions for the same area, the opportunities uh, increase dramatically. So we can use LIDAR, multiple acquisitions of LIDAR to provide uh, spatially explicit measures of height increment over large areas and across a range of forest and site conditions. We can use LIDAR to enable spatially explicit estimates of site quality, and we can use LIDAR to parameterize or develop LIDAR-driven growth simulators. So if growth is a topic of interest to you, I highly recommend this review paper that was led by one of my colleagues here at CFS, Pyotr Tompolsky. This is open access, so it's, it's freely available to you, and it really does a good job of summarizing the, the current state of the art of, of LIDAR for forest growth assessment. So I'm going to talk specifically about a project that we, we finished. Um, we're still working on a bit, but this is harmonizing multi-temporal airborne laser scanning point clouds to derive these periodic annual height increments in temperate mixed wood forests. And again, this work, uh, the first part of this work has been published and is available open access if you are interested. So where did we do this? We did this work at the Petawa Research Forest. And for those of you who are not familiar, uh, this is Canada's oldest research forest. It's located in eastern, southeastern Ontario. It is um, in the Great Lakes St. Lawrence forest region. So it's sort of that transition between more temperate forests to the south and more boreal forests to the north. Uh, we also have a repository of open data for the research forest. This is, we refer to this as our remote sensing super site. So many uh, free and open data sources, including the four LIDAR acquisitions that were used in this analysis and the field plot measurements that were used to, to support this work as well. So there's lots of uh, free data available there for you to access and, and test your algorithms against. So when we work with multi-temporal LIDAR and here at Petawawa, we had one starting in 2005, 2012, again in 2016, in 2018, we actually have another one uh, from this past year as well. Assessments of forest growth can actually be compromised due to variations in the LIDAR acquisitions. So each LIDAR data set is acquired to its own set of specifications, maybe using a different uh, instrument or different geodetic control. So the vertical and horizontal accuracy of each acquisition is going to be different, and the data may be delivered to you in different uh, projections or different vertical datums. So our objective with this project was really to demonstrate the importance of assessing and harmonizing the vertical alignment of multi-temporal airborne LIDAR data sets for the purposes of height growth calculations. So how did we do that? Well, we designed an experiment where we generated a harmonized data set 
and then we generated a data set that was not harmonized, but sort of followed conventional practice that's out there. If you look at the scientific literature of people that have studied, have used multi-temporal LIDAR for growth assessment. So for the non-harmonized data, this is quite simple. Now we picked a reference uh, data set. So based on past analysis we've done, we picked the 2012 as being the best data. And we projected all the other data to the same horizontal projection. So the same referencing system as the 2012. Then we used the 2012 DTM to normalize the heights of all those other point clouds to heights above ground. And then we generated our LIDAR metrics and calculated our increments from that. For the harmonized data, we did a bit more careful checking of the data. So we not only um, projected them into the same horizontal projection, we also transformed them to the same vertical datum because each of these data sets was acquired with a different vertical datum. Um, then we did some planimetric assessment of the data and also checked the vertical alignment. So we looked at permanent features, buildings, paved roads, things that don't change over those time. And although we didn't find any planimetric shifts in the data, we did find um, some vertical differences. So we set out a systematic sample on paved road surfaces to come up with a average height adjustment, which we applied to all the data sets, um, and then used the 2012 again in the same way we did for the non-harmonized to uh, normalize those point clouds to heights above ground, calculate our metrics, and derive our increments. So the question is, did the transformation or did the harmonization uh, make a difference? And the short answer is, uh, yes, it did. So here um, on my left, we have the harmonized data. And we can see that the, inc the average increment across all the different time periods, so we calculated increments using all um, LIDAR data. So it's so all these different time intervals. The average was 2.63 meters for the harmonized data compared to 1.92 for the non-harmonized data. And the one thing you'll notice is that the harmonized data created a much more consistent um, increment series than the non-harmonized data. So the same pattern was observed by forest type. So we had four different types we were looking at, coniferous, broadleaf, mixed wood, and plantations. Uh, the greatest difference between the harmonized and non-harmonized was for the coniferous leading stands, and the smallest difference was for the plantations. So I guess the critical takeaway here is the, the more consistent increment series reduced the uncertainties related to the different LIDAR acquisitions. So although overall there was a strong agreement between the field measured and the LIDAR measures of, of height that we used in our model, we found a weak relationship between the field derived increment and the LIDAR derived increment. And so why we, so we scratch our heads a bit about why that was the case and we dug into the data and we found some, some anomalies, I'll call them in the field data that were impacting the results. So if we plot our annual increment across um, five meter top height classes, if we look at the LIDAR data over here, we see what we would expect biologically, that as, as the, that the increment actually decreases as the height increases. But if we look at the field measurements, we see that this is the case until we get to about 30 meters, and then the increment actually starts to increase again. And becomes very high for trees that are higher than 40 meters. Because we have the LIDAR data available to us for dates corresponding to our field plots, we can sort of go back and do a retrospective assessment and kind of figure out what's going on. So using the LIDAR, we could identify systematic errors in the field-based tree height measurements in plots that had complex crowns, tall trees, and restricted visibility. This issue seems to be greatest in in Petawawa for unmanaged stands that are dominated by white pine. And, and I'm sure many of us who've gone out in the field and measured trees know how hard this is to do, um, to do accurately. So what this figure shows you is the dark purple dots are the LIDAR from 2012. The green is 2018. 
The solid lines represent the heights, the 99th percentile from the LIDAR point clouds in 2012 and 2018. The dashed lines represent the field measured top heights for those same years in those same colors. What we see is that um, in these two cases, these first two cases, the top height measure in the field far exceeds any um, data that we have in the point cloud. And in the last case here, we see that the 2012 measure of top height is actually greater than the 2018 measure of top, field measure of top height. And of course, these, these errors in height measurement propagate into the calculated increments as well. So for this particular plot, you'll see the difference between the field measured increment at 6.9 meters versus the LIDAR at 0 0.78 meters. Uh, similarly, this even greater, the field measure was 11.7 versus 1.63 meters. And in this case, because we have, have this higher 2012, we actually get a negative increment in this case, whereas the LIDAR is telling us it was a positive increment over time. So uh, I guess one of the key takeaways from this is that these types of errors um, in some difficult stand conditions are really hard to control, uh, but it does point out that it, you need to check your field measurements very carefully. We could do this in our case because we have coincident LIDAR, but for older PSP measurements, for example, you might not have that data available to, to um, interrogate those in the same way. The, the second, I guess, key takeaway is that our results demonstrate that systematic differences in the vertical alignment amongst multi-temporal LIDAR data sets may result in errors in derived height growth increments and demonstrated that uh, careful assessments uh, and harmonization of multi-temporal LIDAR should uh, be applied in order to obtain accurate estimates of height growth. So harmonization is a necessary step if your intention is to use the LIDAR data for height growth assessment. I guess that's the, that's the message. And this is especially important, of course, if you have short time intervals between your LIDAR acquisitions and your forests uh, grow relatively slowly. So the, the increment data generated from this project is available on the super site um, if you are interested and in, there's a link there at the bottom. So what to do next with this? We want to use these, these increments now to try and develop age-independent height growth models. And this is used following an approach that was published uh, a couple of years ago, which is really about finding a, height, defining a height growth rate at a given reference height rather than a given reference age. The reason for this, of course, is because we can't get age from LIDAR. So we're trying to leverage what the LIDAR does best, and that is measure canopy heights. And so that's our focus. And then once we have derived this height growth rate index, then of course the intention is to, to map it wall to wall in a spatially explicit way um, as we can. The next thing I want to talk about then is identifying canopy layers. When we do an area-based um, attribute estimate for, for an EFI, the LIDAR looks at the entire plot. It looks at everything in the plot. We generate an estimate of volume, for example, and it's for that whole, um, it's for everything in the plot. But in this case, we have a uniform shelter wood. So this stuff at the bottom here is actually regenerating pine underneath this canopy of mature pines. And so if we are interested in only knowing where's the volume in that upper canopy layer or what's the volume in the lower canopy layer, it, Conventionally, we, we can't do that with an area-based estimate unless we find a way to separate those two, um, to separate those two and, and predict them independently or allocate the prediction correctly to those two layers. And that's what this project is about. So this is a KTD project that's being led by Dr. Margaret Penner. We're also doing this work at Petawawa. So in Petawawa, we have four, um, sort of vertical structure types that we're interested in classifying. These top two single layer stands, here we have a side profile from the LIDAR, and these complex stands we treat as single layer stands. And so it's status quo for the EFI. When we do an area-based prediction, it's just as we normally would. For stands where we have a single layer, where we have veteran trees that have been left um, on the site, or where we have obvious two layer stands, 
then we will process those as two layer stands. So we've developed an automated approach to classify um, grid cells in, into these four classes. And then um, in order to process the two layer stands, we need to predict the height of the top of the lower layer. And once we've done that, we use that height then to distinguish an upper layer and a lower layer. And we allocate the EFI attributes by layer. So the advantage of this is it allows us to provide uh, much more rich information in the area-based inventory for the purposes of forest planning or um, operations. And key thing is we are not telling, we are not designating which of the layers is the managed layer. Obviously that's up to the forest manager uh, to determine. And lastly, I just want to talk about uh, highlight a project that we're doing in BC, characterizing riparian areas. So this is a, an NSERC strategic partnership project. It's being led by Nicholas Koops and Scott Hinch at UBC. Partners in the project include ourselves, the Canadian Forest Service, and BC Timber Sales. So uh, the first part of this project was really to look at conventional LIDAR. So, so LIDAR that you would have acquired for your land base to support your inventory or support your operations. It's not specialized bathymetric LIDAR specifically designed for stream mapping or anything like that. And to, to see to what degree we can um, accurately derive attributes that are important for forest management. So these include things like bank full width, in-stream large and medium wood, percent canopy cover, stream gradient, and stream morphological units. And these stream morphological units are very important for fish habitat assessments. And these are the, the riffles, the pools, the cascades, and the glides that you see here um, in this figure. And so this work was led by Spencer. He's a, a PhD student at UBC, and his this Part of the work has now been published and is open access if you're interested in learning more about what was done there. Um, next steps are really to, um, Spencer's developed a fully automated approach to identify in-stream wood, uh, again, just using regular conventional LIDAR and focusing on large um, pieces in particular. And then uh, there's another student at UBC, Liana, and she's looking at discriminating unique riparian forest structures, and seeing how current um, management zones that are defined around riparian act, uh, areas actually capture um, that riparian vegetation. So how, how well do riparian reserve zones, for example, capture the actual extent of riparian influencing vegetation on the landscape? So again, these are all applications that are not um, that are value added. There are extra things you can do uh, with the LIDAR data you have available to you, and especially leveraging some of your older uh, LIDAR data in the case of uh, growth assessments. And that is it for me. I welcome any questions. Thank you so much, Joanne. Um, yeah, please type in your questions in the chat um, as uh, yeah, we have a few minutes for, for, for questions. It's really uh, interesting to see all these value added products. I think we're not gonna see the end of uh, LIDAR acquisition by provinces uh, given all everything that you can do with it. <laughs> um, I had a quick question, I guess, uh, uh, if to, to lead things off, Joanne. Um, it, it, some some people have acquired already province wide uh, you know d d d uh, lidar acquisition you know uh, airborne laser scanning while other people are starting or have not completed uh, is there any uh, possibility of merging and then with your work with uh, different types of acquisition is there any types of um, is there a possibility to merge you know UAV lidar with aerial to like fill in the gaps or to expand gaps in a more cost effective way while still have a meaningful comparison comparable data set um, I think that's um, not as straightforward as it seems to do. Um, okay. UAV LIDARs are a bit different, so um, they have different strengths um, and different applications. And I, mean, I think the way people generally deploy UAV LIDAR is if they're interested in getting more detail within the canopy, or mm -hmm. they're doing specific targeted, like we saw Brandon's example, where they have a specific area 
where they need information rather than across their entire land base. And of course, we're still somewhat restricted by the range with which UAV lidars can fly. So for you know the, the size of management areas we're dealing with in Canada, it's, it, it, UAV has a, a certain application, but it's not management area level data collection. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. So yeah, it's not easy to stitch some of these together, especially when they're different, acquired on different different uh, modes of transport. Um, okay, so Thuang has a question here. Uh, do you have any study on using LIDAR data in fire behavior modeling or classifying forest fuel types? Um, I don't uh, specifically, but that certainly, I mean, uh, many other people are are working on that. Definitely, it's uh, it's. Uh, a topic of great interest. I think um, particularly how you can parameterize those models using information that you get from LIDAR, uh, that can be very helpful. So David also has a question here. He starts by saying, thanks, Joanne. The calculation of site index via height, uh, height delta between LIDAR captures has been our focus over the past couple of years. Great inventory and management tool for harvest prescription timing. Mm -hmm. Definitely, yes. It's great. <laughs> and then Jean Martin uh, mentioned it says, uh, Joanne, any advice on the minimum time between like LIDAR acquisition for a decent uh, PAI measure? Um, I would say it depends on where you are, obviously, but but likely um, five years is reasonable if I had to pick a number. But I think for most, um, realistically speaking, for most jurisdictions, by the time we get around to, she says opportunistically, by the time we get around to a second uh, lighter acquisition, it will be um, more than that. And and that is that is not a bad thing. Um, so for example, in, in our case, uh, for Petawawa, we had 13 years between acquisitions, and that was a, a that was that was okay. That was good. So, well, that's encouraging because I, I know it's not easy. Uh, not only acquiring these data, but also getting your financing to get these data. <laughs> uh, uh, so, follow up question from Jean Martin: How do you cope with canopy canopy disturbances? Yeah, that's a good question. So. There, yeah, so I think you have to incorporate, um, obviously you have to incorporate any disturbance information you have into your assessment. So if, um, if an area has been harvested, for example, you would exclude it. If you're generating a wall-to-wall -wall product, you would have to um, exclude uh, those areas as well. Um, another challenge is when you have mortality in the stand where maybe you're losing uh, just a few trees in between acquisitions. And um, I'm actually involved in a project right now where we're, we're trying to um, automate the classification of those areas so that um, you, you can flag those grid cells prior to applying your model. So you can see where there's actually been a, a decrease in height due to mortality. So it's a great question. It's definitely something you have to uh, keep in mind. And that would apply also to broken tops, eh? Just if they're for a windblown event. Uh... Yes, it could. It depends, okay. I guess, on the tree type as well. Yeah. OK, yeah. OK. Great. It seems like we're getting less questions coming in or not at all anymore. So uh, on that note, I'll thank you, Joanne, for that presentation. Really insightful. And uh, I, I want to thank everyone, uh, especially our speakers, for coming out and, 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 and sharing their insights into this, this, this world. Um, without them, it would be, uh, well, we would have no event. And I, mean, I think we all learn a, a tremendous deal from, from this uh, cross-country checkup. Um, even though we sometimes feel like we're repeating the same information, but there's always some new nuances and, and new things to glean from each other. Um, before we wrap up, I just want 
and now will be the time, I guess, to put up our little surveys. If we, if you have a second or two to help uh, us just get an idea on who's interested in this information, uh, we have these quick little um, surveys to say if, uh, I guess, how valuable was the seminar and where you're joining us from today and uh, what, what um, is uh, the nature of your work. Um, so if you have a second, please fill out these, these, this questionnaire. It'll help us figure out how to best reach the, our audience with this information. And uh, finally, thank you to, to having attended this, this uh, seminar. It's, uh, it's always great to see <laughs> some familiar faces and some new faces. Um, so thank you and goodbye.